I'm Eric from Longbox Review. I'm Peter from The Daily Rios. And this is episode 25 of Eric and Peter's Legion Project Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Legion Project Podcast. This is Peter. And this is Eric. And we are back for uh, the Legion Project Podcast. As we mentioned, this is episode 25, which means we're covering issue 25, which means we are now starting the third year of the Baxter series run. And we just celebrated... In the gap between the two uh, episodes, this episode and last episode, we just celebrated our own third anniversary. So happy three years, Eric. Yeah, same to you, Peter. It's it's this has been uh, such a fun uh, project for us. I, I at least from my perspective, anyway. Um, and and uh, the the response from the listeners uh, has always been very gracious and uh entertaining and inf- informative and so i i am looking forward to what the third year of the show and these uh, this, uh set of issues uh will reveal to me personally because i like i said uh these are these are new to me the these stories these issues so this is i'm i'm discovering along with the listeners uh who may be new to this series yeah i'm actually in kind of like the same position a tiny bit here as we wrap up the censor girl mystery uh in in i think two more issues after that there are some storylines that i know that i've read but there's some in between stuff that as i look at the covers i kind of go hmm i have no idea what's going on on the inside there <laughs> so as familiar as I was of year of year two of the Baxter run and everything that I learned about year one from rereading it, um, this is this is going to be fun to, to kind of go along uncharted territory, I guess, for both of us in some in one way or another. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. I'm, that that should be that should be a lot of fun. I mean, because there's again, as we set this up way, way, way back in episode one. Um, I think our love of the Legion, um, of the Legion of Superheroes obviously is very strong. They, they're, they're a a series of characters and titles that we want to read, but I, I often say that there are, um, uh, people out there who, who just have, uh, a greater in-depth knowledge than I do. Um, you know, the, the, there, there are Legion experts that can quote you, uh, story chapter titles and, and issue numbers and first appearances and the exact order of how the Legion, uh, how members joined, you know, and I have, I have a great knowledge of, of what I've read, but there's a lot that I haven't read. So Mm -hmm. I think the part of the fun of, maybe that's why we, we initially called it a project is because it is it's an ongoing thing, right? We're learning a lot about the characters and the stories that we're reading now, but I'm also really learning about the history of the Legion through all of this too. Yeah, it it reading this stuff it affords me the opportunity quite often here. I'm I'm finding uh, as we as we go through these issues, little things will just kind of pop up, and it's not necessarily. Uh, directly relating to the issue that we're covering. Like, for example, today, uh, for today's episode, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, an entry in Who's Who for one of the Legionnaires, and that prompted me to go back and look at a bunch of adventure 
comics appearances of the Legion just because I wanted to find out this one little detail. <laughs> and so I basically went through two <laughs> Omnibi uh, that I have um, oh my. searching for this stuff. Yeah, you know, just just real quick, real, or real quick um, flipping through the pages to, to find appearances of this character. But it was it was just such a neat, I don't know, I, I, I enjoy that kind of stuff. So uh, this is this has been a lot of fun in in a lot in a lot of different ways. Good, 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 good. And uh, there has been some time since our last episode, which is obviously nothing new to the Legion project. Um, uh, I have <laughs> moved yet again. <laughs> Anybody who listens to the Daily Rios, you know. Um, so I am in a new location. I remember recording another Legion project a while back, two years back, sort of saying the same thing. I don't know what the acoustics are going to sound like. Um, there might be a barking dog. Um, there might be traffic. There might be something. Who knows? I don't know. You know, I'm still on my uh, on a loner laptop here. So a lot of variables. Um, so please uh, forgive any sort of audio stuff on my end. Um still working all that stuff out but you know at least we get a chance to to sit here and and, and talk which is fun mhm yeah and and uh i i feel like i need to uh, apologize to some degree um because part of the the length of time between these episodes was i had a i had a bike accident uh back in uh early september that uh, delayed uh, Peter and 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 myself getting together to record uh, this 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 uh, this episode. So anyway, uh, I talk about that on 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 one of my gutters episodes. Uh, that's that's in the feed now. But uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's been an interesting um, about a well at least a month. Uh, but it was longer than that. I can't can't remember when we last recorded the last Legion episode, Peter. I mean, it dropped. The last Legion episode dropped like at the beginning of August, so it might even have been in, oh, in July. It was in or, July. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, it's. <laughs> I could hear Daryl Taylor right now. Where's Where's my episode? <laughs> <laughs> Daryl and also um, uh, one of the the uh, another listener on uh, Twitter, uh, who's been you know really great, uh, Chris Matthews, who. Mm -hmm. uh, posted a link to some really great Legion resource stuff and, and, but also, you know, clamoring for this next episode. So we'll dedicate this one. We dedicated one for Daryl before we'll dedicate this one to Chris. It's, <laughs> Chris is hankering for some Legion talk as are we, yeah. believe me, I'm, I'm yeah. sure both Eric and I, you know, we're right there with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other preamble thing I have, uh, just so we can get into the issue is, uh, Sometime around um, when San Diego had their Comic-Con at home uh, set of videos on YouTube, we recorded an episode with George over at the Meanwhile at the Podcast podcast. That would be episode 66. It was released back in August, talking about, uh, well, talking about a whole bunch of stuff, talking about mm -hmm. uh, San Diego and, and comics and, and conventions in general, but then also some Star Trek talk and um, so it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, you know, you and I getting to talk about other things um, outside of the Legion universe. Yeah. And it's always, always fun to, to, to be able to play in, you know, George's sandbox. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Anytime I get to talk to my, my friends, my, my online friends, <laughs> the people I only interact with online, um, uh, and, and talk about the, my favorite things in life, you know, I, I, I will jump at that chance. Shall we jump into Legion of Superheroes issue number 25? All right. Uh, this, uh, this issue is titled Revelation, and this is uh, written by Paul Levitz with Greg LaRocque and Mike DiCarlo, DiCarlo as artists, uh, along with an inking assist from Arn Starr. I believe it's the second inking assist issue. Uh, John Costanza continues as letterer, Carl Gafford as colorist, and Karen Berger as editor, with a cover by Steve Lytle and Ed Hannigan. So, issue 25. The Emerald Empress addresses her new Fatal Five, Persuader, Flair, Caress, and another female member. But who could it be? 
Near Earth, Brainy leads a group of Legionnaires to find the just-departed Sensor Girl, from last issue. At the Metropolis Spaceport, White Witch, Element Lad, and Lightning Lass are transmuting an emerald in an attempt to lure the Emerald Empress into a mm, rather silly-looking science police trap. Sensor Girl's trail leads Dawnstar and the others to Shanghala, the Legion Cemetery, but they do not find the missing Legionnaire. Instead, Brainiac 5 is nearly crispy fried by a vengeful mono. Later, Dawnstar determines that once Sensor Girl arrived on Shanghala, it is though she ceased to exist. Colossal Boy, Dream Girl, and some others arrive at planet Stratus looking for the missing Legion Academy member Mentala. They are swiftly attacked by the Fatal Five, and a fight ensues. Just as Sensor Girl arrives, we shift back to Earth, where Element Lad seeks Saturn Girl's counsel, where Sensor Girl is concerned, and Imra reveals to Jan that she was already a Legionnaire. Back on Stratus, Sensor Girl aids the Legionnaires, but the tide turns when Mentala, the fifth member of the Fatal Five, appears. The Emerald Empress then overpowers Sensor Girl and finally reveals to all who she really is. And do we finally get to say it, Peter? Go ahead, say it. Say it. <laughs> it's Princess Projectra. Queen Projectra at this point, right? Oh, oh that's very true. Very t- Well, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but yeah, she was she was crowned queen uh, the last time, I think, the, around the last time that we saw her. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't Maybe remember. we should just refer to her as Projectra. <laughs> right. Which was smart. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Hmm. Can we talk about the covers first without actually giving our thoughts to the story? I want to save that. I want to savor okay. your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's talk about the two covers. We have... Legion of Superheroes 25, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, with Lido and Ed Hannigan. And then we have Tales of the Legion of Superheroes, issue number 350, more or less, uh, you could say even like an anniversary. Yeah, um, it, it normally would have been it had this not just been a reprint uh, uh, comic. Right. And, and that's depicting uh, a fight scene also by Ed Hannigan, this time with uh, DiCarlo. Mm-hmm. on inks so um uh what are your thoughts on the covers well okay so i mean they, they both both covers reveal or show something that uh, more or less is depicted in in the issue so i have complained before about certain covers in the in the recent past how they are how they were not uh, not fulfilling the promise that they they show on the cover, right? But this this is, I mean, the the the, the Legion twenty five cover is uh, very thematic. I'll say, you know, it, we we get a reveal, well, we get an unmasking, I should say, of project <laughs> of Sensor Girl. <laughs> now I'm gonna I'm gonna screw that up all the time um, by the Emerald Empress, which is what happens in here, just not in the way it's depicted. But it's you know it, it, it's very stark in 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 the with the black background and a spotlight. I mean, it's, like I said, it's, it's very thematic in this, in the way that it's uh, showing the events that, uh, that occur here. And then you get the, the classic Legion floating head reactions that we've seen on, on many uh, a Legion comic book cover. So I, I'd like that callback to, to, uh, you know, the past Legion lore um, or, what, what's what's a better word than lore but um and and then and then just the 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 enticement the tease if you will of of uh sensor girl being unmasked on that cover so i really really like that i mean if i if i had been uh uh perusing the uh the, the stands at the comic book shop back then um and i'm sure i did you know uh why i didn't buy this this book, I don't know. Um, uh, even up to this point, three years into the run, I'm like, why? Why wasn't I buying this book? Because uh, I, I, I didn't get the tail stuff either. So I think I just eventually dropped it at this point, Peter. Which is, which seems very weird to me. Um, but that that cover now to me just screams, you got to buy me. 
even without the even without the text that's underneath the the title there the the comic title you know finally sensor girl revealed well we don't need that actually it's we see it so i don't know why they put that on there I'd like that they, I wonder if they did, obviously did this on purpose, that they kept Sensor Girl's hair yellow, blonde, Mm -hmm. even though the mask is ripped off for that one, one last little, yeah, uh, yeah, (laughs) oh, could it still be Supergirl? That's right, that's right. (laughs) You know, for any reader out there who was hoping among, you know, uh, the the post-crisis that she still existed, um, uh, and there's there's things about you know I think what you said is right the design of the cover you know you got Ed Hannigan right and um, I don't I don't know the complete history of Ed Hannigan but I know when you get an Ed Hannigan cover there's a design sense to it um, not that they're all familiar just that I think Ed Hannigan was really good at cover design in the sense of of grabbing your attention you know putting the focus on a certain thing. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not like when you see like a Sienkiewicz cover or a Paris cover and you're like, okay, that's a Paris cover. Um, there's just something about, obviously they, Ed Hannigan's name is all over a bunch of DC titles. So I don't know if, if his title was like some kind of art director at the time or whatever. And then to get his name on Tales 350 and, um, clearly depicting a scene that's inside the book um it's it's not necessary like nothing really jumps out at me about 350 i certainly don't prefer it over issue 25 um i think what's kind of funny is that the little sensor girl nod revealed at last sensor girl secret is so tiny it's all up in the corner but it is up by mm-hmm. the logo mm-hmm. which if these things are hanging out on a on a rack or even a um a spinner rack all you're really going to see is the top third yeah so so that's smart if tiny <laughs> yeah my my thought on that was uh initially was um well first of all uh i i love that tales 350 cover too because it's again like the like issue 25 it's kind of a classic legion cover because they're just it's just a battle scene uh, between them and and one of their major uh nemeses the fatal five uh and it's it's very well done um you know hannigan and DiCarlo do an excellent job here on this uh i don't have any com- complaints really about it but initially i was thinking well but it doesn't it's not the fight isn't really the point of the issue the point of the issue is the reveal of sensor girl and yet, as you pointed out, she's in this, you know, the upper right corner of, of the, of the, of the cover. And, and so detracts from that important event in the issue. But then, uh, I thought later, well, maybe that's on purpose because, you know, this is a reprint issue <laughs> and, and, uh, the, the reveal has already happened a year ago and you know it's not as a, a prevalent uh, an event as it was, and so to sell the issue more, perhaps you know they de- they depict this fight scene between the Legion and the Fatal Five instead. So I don't know, maybe marketing wise, that's that's a much better approach. Yeah, and I think we've seen that a couple times on some of the Tales covers where the focus is on something different, um, obviously than the first time. The cover was designed, um, but then we've also remarked, you know, oh, they chose to focus on that this time, mm-hmm. um, whether it had to do with like Supergirl's death in the crisis or something else. So, yeah, that that makes sense. It makes sense. I think the inks a little. I think the I don't know if DiCarlo's inking over Hannigan is all that uh, stellar. Um, it comes across. Uh, like especially in the in the for, the the biceps the the mus, muscle work in Persuader and Colossal Boy, mm-hmm. there's also there's something. Uh, it's like when Greg Theakston inks Jack Kirby, where it, where it feels very thick, and it feels um, makes them look almost like toys. The figures look like toy figures. Or I know, mm. um, I'm trying to think of who the inker was. 
John Dell, maybe, over Howard Porter when Morrison's JLA was going on. And a lot of, you know, Howard Porter's style is very, um, the characters are, are, are they, they, for lack of a better way to describe it, they look like action figures almost mm-hmm. um, on the comic book page. And then you get that thick inking on it and it, and it kind of also accentuates this feeling I always get in my mind when I look at that early Howard Porter JLA work. Um, and I, and I kind of get that sense here where it's like, uh, there's not a lot of subtlety in the inking, <laughs> um, you know, foreground, background stuff, shading, brush stroke work. Uh, it's, it's not really there. Everybody's kind of got the same amount of black inks all over them. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they almost blend into the rock structure behind them. <laughs> So, um, but I will say in terms of like the covers that we have been seeing, yeah, I mean, it it depicts the interior. I'm still obviously going to give the nod to the Baxter cover for this. So, Mm -hmm. but I liked what you said about marketing because I have, I have some thoughts about that when it comes to the story itself. And I think the cover, both covers are, are, have that element to it in ways that I don't think other covers have had uh, unless we talk about that we want you in the legion from issue 17 right or whatever that Mm -hmm. was um where it was like okay clearly they're targeting the readers so i think some of that is going on here as you mentioned so general thoughts uh this has been a long time coming uh because you know you've said some things about expectations that you want and and uh uh, you know, the, the last issue, the cover had some some little, you know, bait and switch to it that that mm-hmm. readers at the time also reacted to. But um, right. Uh, I'm just curious, what are your thoughts about this issue and what are your thoughts about the uh, revelation of the identity of Sensor Girl? Mm hmm. Well, I mentioned uh, in, in reference to the cover, I, I use the word tease, and uh, in my notes for my initial thoughts for this issue, I use that same word um, because I love I love the the teases and the reveals throughout this issue. So, just from a storytelling standpoint, this was a fun issue to um, uh, to read because we get those things coming paced throughout the the 20 or however many pages that we get um 20 or so pages uh and it's it's just a, like a non-stop uh not really action but not action in in like a um a physical sense but just the action of the story going through we get a lot of that going on through here i and so i really like that uh i am <laughs> While I while I uh, like the reveal, uh, I'm also frustrated by it um, because we don't get what what it is that I really want, which is the why. Why is Projector Sensor Girl? Why mm-hmm. did she do this? Why was she? Re- uh, uh, why did she not reveal her identity to her some of her closest companions? Um, what is the purpose of this? And 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 what is the connection between her and Emerald Empress besides w- that which we've already talked about? Um, because it's uh, there's some, there's something that happens in in this issue where I'm like, what? is there is there really more to this, or am I just reading into it kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, like I said, it's it's just a, the issue as a whole. I and the way it it was structured, uh, it just it was just a I thought a really great way to keep keep us coming back, keep us one turning the pages to to get to the end, and not just because you know we know that Sensor Girl's identity is going to be revealed, but just in terms of what's going on in the story with with all these characters. Um, but then also to get us to come back for the next issue or the, you know, the next several issues to, 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 to finally put a cap on what this mystery really is about. Cause it's not just about the identity. It's about the why. Well, I think I would argue that it is, it's a, it's more about the identity in terms of like reader conversations, right? Mm-hmm. Don't you think, like in like in the letter comms that we've been reading, everybody's guessing, trying to guess who it is, but we haven't. Did we get a lot of letters saying why well, it is? Why sure? Why they, you know, yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you know, that's that to me, that's just the surface part of it. You know, it's, sure. uh, it, it, I'm always more interested in the motivations of a character as opposed to the, the identity of the character, I guess. Right. Right. No, that, to- that totally makes sense. And I, I feel like the, the, um, you know, the, the big cliffhanger, I wonder if they would have given us the reveal midway through and then also gave us some explanation of of why or reactions from the legionnaires like i feel like um they i like that they ended it with the reveal because that that's been the mm-hmm. big thing who is she who is she who is she who is she you know brainiac the legionnaires um readers been saying i can remember at the time you know a, a little bit of thinking you know i don't know who it is who is it and then when they did reveal it i was like oh i don't think i've read much of projector at the time <laughs> Um, uh, so, so I do, I like I like that they, they ended it in the clip with the cliffhanger because it's the thing it, I think that's the thing that DC has been selling the, the title certainly could sell why she did, why she's doing what she's doing. But the, the, the trade talk always was, well, who is it? Sure. Who is it? You know, especially because everybody wanted it to be Supergirl, you know? <laughs> and I feel like part of that is that that marketing aspect that we we've been talking about the cover has filtered into the story because this story read oddly expositiony um mm-hmm. uh almost like a stan lee part part stan lee part chris claremont um uh it when i was reading it i was thinking Boy, they're 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 really going out of their way to explain or at least mention character names, powers, the situation. Um, and then it wasn't until about midway through the issue where I got a real good sense of what you were talking about, where things just were starting to ramp up, right? They were just starting to, oh, here we go. You know, we're getting closer and closer to the Fatal Five. Oh, here comes, um. Here comes Sensor Girl, and then, and then it switches to another scene, and then we cut to Element Lad and Saturn Girl, where we get uh, the reveal that she's been a Legionnaire before, which is something we knew from a Meanwhile column, but if you weren't reading it, you didn't know that. Uh, then we go back to the fight. Oh nope, the true traitor is Mentala. You know, like that midway through, it almost felt like I wanted to see it in a live action or cartoon, or you could just. <laughs> You could kind of hear the music building and and the yeah. cuts and all that. So yeah, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like very that. cinematic. Yeah, yeah. I was I was a big fan of like rereading this, and I've I read this issue about three times before we recorded. Um, I, the first bunch of pages, I wondered if they were constructed um with the notion that they knew people were going to pick this up that probably maybe never read a legion issue before it because they knew that this was the revelation uh, the reveal at least of the identity um or maybe they came from last issue or something like that so you know you get the introduction of this new fatal five and number one they are all saying their name or somebody else is saying their name and they're all describing their powers and I get it, they're doing it in front of a mystery character, but it all felt very Stan Lee, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I'm the, I'm the, you know, uh, snow thrower because I throw snow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, just something about it kind of. And then there was some stuff with like Brainiac 5 and some of the other Legionnaires, you know, once again saying, oh, I think she's a fake. Oh, I think she's this. Oh, I think she's Supergirl's clone. Like Levitz is just hitting all the beats that we've already seen over and yeah. over again. But because they probably thought, well, it's issue 25, which is also technically an anniversary issue. Maybe somebody new would come to this book. So we want to make sure it's it's open to everybody so yeah i it's a strength obviously but i i also thought of it as a little bit as i was reading i was kind of like oh that's that's i don't need all that but then you know (laughs) i get it i get it do you do you do you think that uh this the stuff that you're describing is 
uh, overpowering or clunky or I found it I found it clunky but also dry I found it mm. I found it um, almost uh, static like that they're almost ro- robotic in the way they were talking mm. like not yeah. that usual deep Paul Levitt's um, not that he gets super deep, but you know, like we've been enjoying Levitz's dialogue, his story. Like he, he can convey emotion. He can convey how these characters talk to each other, so it feels like they're friends. And and there was just stuff like, here's this person talking because they need to get this information out. Here's mm-hmm. this person talking so they can get this information out. Right. So, whereas I feel the second half of the book when we got things like um, the Persuader and Colossus Boy going at it yet again, you know, um, uh, the motivation or, or some of the, f- the, the, the conversation between Saturn girl and element lad is, is pretty decent, you know, um, between element, uh, between Emerald Empress and, and sensor girl. It, it's fast, but you get this, it should be right. It's, it's high tension at the end. There's a lot of emotion, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure as we go through it, you know, some of it will stick out. Um, it did make me hate the issue by no means, but it did, I, I, I sort of dropped it down maybe a notch or two because of that. But, but I, I also feel bad for faulting them because I understand their position as a business sense, in a business sense. If that's what they did. Mm-hmm. So I also unfortunately thought the artwork took a step back. Really? Yeah. Um I forget what issue it was that I I was I really liked you know there were a couple splash pages of like Emerald Empress and and it might have even been last issue. Mhm. There, there's a few things in here that uh I don't know if it was because there's so much script, there's so many different scenes um that maybe LaRoque it, it, it's almost like you don't ever get to live in a sequence long enough to really get your pencil around figures and, and, and backgrounds because, oh, here they are on Earth. Oh, here they are on Emerald Empress's planet. Oh, here they are on Shanghala. Here they are. You know what I mean? Like they just, he kept having to bounce. And it's like, ugh, I got to do another background, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um um, and I feel like the two reveals, not not the last one, not the cliffhanger, um, two other ones, the reveal of Mentala mm-hmm. and the reveal of Sensor Girl, um, in where where Emerald Empress is like, ah, here comes the final player or whatever, and it's like, and it's just like the the Ed Hannigan cover for three fifty Tales three fifty, where Sensor Girl's like way in the back, she's just a small little flying towards colossal boy you know um and maybe that's pur- purposeful maybe so that it's it's it is a page t- well there is a page turn after it but maybe it's not so big because well she's she's not joining the fatal five right like 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 it almost feels like the story is setting it up to be so i don't know there's just a couple things in there um art wise that i was like ooh, i'm ooh, okay I don't like that. Well, I would agree with you that there were some spots uh, that I also had a, a similar reaction to. Uh, but <laughs> it's funny because I actually quite enjoyed the art overall in this issue. And I thought that um, because uh, in the Legion Companion book, uh, in the LaRoque interview, he talks about how here, let me, I have to find find my notes here on this. Uh, uh, LaRoque commented that uh, Paul Levitz was starting to give him looser scripts to play with. And 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 that made me think, well, is is this the point that uh, Paul Levitz was kind of letting letting go of the reins a little bit and letting LaRoque play around on the page? Because we get a lot of uh, a lot of uh, panel breaking images to where, you know, things that happen in one panel are actually overlapping into the other panels. Um, 
we got I, I thought we got a lot of different uh close up versus um uh what's what's the opposite of close up peter <laughs> <laughs> it's like far away shots the, the, yeah the far away shots i know i just i felt like he was kind of playing around with the structure of of what's on the page and how he's presenting it but but within the constraints that that you mentioned as well you know there there are a lot of panels in here where we don't get any backgrounds or um the the, the characters don't qu- look quite right uh for whatever reason and so yeah i mean it was it was kind of messy but i also thought that there's for me at least there was kind of a a step forward in the art and it's been progressing that way for the last few issues um from my perspective right where i'm getting or or maybe i'm just getting more comfortable with laroque and his interpretation of these characters right i uh, i think that's the because like i said i did like last issue and i think you're right like you know we i thought i thought we reached a point uh might have even been the last episode where uh, you know, it was starting to get unfair that we were comparing LaRoque to Lido because Lido has mm-hmm. been gone now, you know, for right. almost 10 issues or whatever, whatever it's been. And this is LaRoque's book now. Um, and it has been. So, uh, yeah, I th- I think you're right. I, it, there is a uh, if, if there's any sort of criticism on my part, it's just because I want LaRoque to when you see those flashes of, of really great art. Um, I love the duality of opening up on em- Emerald Empress, Empress in a splash page and then closing with Projectra in a full page splash page. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, and both figures are great. You know, they're, he's obviously, um, you can tell he's steering it to a, a male demographic, but um, um, <laughs> they're great shots, you know. And actually, I like the page before the reveal of Projectra. I like that page a lot. So, uh, yeah, I think if any, if there's any sort of like, like you said, if a, if a character, f- character's face looks wonky, it's like, ah, come on. It's, uh, you know, the consistency is really what I want more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that for sure. Yeah. And, and since we're talking about this, I want, I, I wanted to mention this, um, on page three, uh, we get that beautiful, almost splash pagey shot of of uh dawn star flying in space as she's as they're heading off to to look for sensor girl and i just thought that was a beautiful um picture of her and and uh of course i in the legion companion i read you know uh she was one of laroque's favorites so i, I totally get why he's doing this or, or showing us dawn star in this way um it is a little sexualized but <laughs> Or maybe a lot, but um, but it's but it's a beautiful drawing of of this character, uh, and we get, I think there's another there's another Dawn Star focused panel in in the issue as well, uh, just just to underline the thought uh, the the uh, the the yeah the thought that um, that he really likes this character. So, like I said, you get you get you get these wonderful bits like this, and then then you that but then the issue is balanced by some p- perhaps less um, sophisticated, uh, work. Let me ask you this. You're a big fatal five fan. Mm. What do you think of the new fatal five as of this (laughs) issue? Uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, the, there's some interesting parallels here because when the fatal five was first introduced and we talked about this in a previous episode, uh, they were just there. Uh, they they were presented as the uh, as villains that have been around within the universe, but we'd never seen them, and 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 so um, uh, they were just presented. And here here they are; they've come together, and and really, it's the Legion's fault that the Fatal Five exist in the first place. But you know, we'll set that aside. Uh, and and here, it's not really the same thing, uh, except for them coming together, I guess, uh, as as a as a team, as it were. And I have to say, I'm not as impressed <laughs> with this lineup. And I think it has more to do with not the characters themselves, because really they're just they're just ciphers at this point. Uh, at least at least two, maybe three of them, right? So uh, you can't count Emerald Empress and Persuader because they they're the existing members and they've been they've been around for decades at this point. But the the three new members um, we've seen, Flair once before in a previous issue and here she is again uh 
and then we get new member caress right and she and this is this is what i thought like you were mentioning the kind of clunkiness of of some of the stuff in the issue and and this this is one of those things where you know she's <laughs> she's just introduced hey you're you're caress i'm the if i'm the fourth i care not who the fifth who is fifth flair uh and then a little bit later uh as she's introducing herself to the fifth member save your posturing for enemies mistress you promised great wealth and power and my acid touch is ready to seize both so it like 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 you said it's just it's very expositional it's hey i'm caress and i have acid powers um I guess what I object to those two characters in particular is all they care about is, well, Caress says wealth and power, and Flair just seems to be going along with it. I can't remember from the last two. She was stealing something. She was, well, not something. She was stealing a ship. Mm -hmm. And and for that reason, Empress was impressed by her and invited her to join the team. But all she is shown uh, all she yeah all she has shown is doing here is just going along with whatever empress is saying which i don't want i don't necessarily want to get into this but that seems counter to the character that i've seen in that previous issue she doesn't seem like that kind of a person that would just go along with empress but that's neither here nor there because we don't we we haven't been given enough of these characters and yes, I, I think I'm being unfair here because these are the the introductions of these characters, more or less. Uh, I don't know. They they in the battle with the Legionnaires, they function. I guess I was gonna say they function well enough as a team, but they really aren't actually. I don't know if we want to jump jump into that, but uh, they're very much individuals in a group setting reacting to the event so i'll just leave it at that and we can get into the details later if you want yeah no i, I think you're right like it, it especially because mentala just joins well i mean that's who they're talking to in those first pages obviously right mm -hmm. they're talking mm -hmm. although you're supposed to think that it's sensor girl um and then mentala pops up and and obviously you know it's not like they probably did a lot of training <laughs> Right, right. But even Emerald Empress's motivations, as we saw in last episode, last issue, where she says, I need people to rule, right? When she was talking to Persuader, you know, she's like, I need slaves. I need mm -hmm. people. Um, uh, I think I think it's it's one of the weaker plot points or weaker um, story structure elements of the, of this issue where. The Fatal Five is there to motivate the Sensor Girl mystery, mm -hmm. but there's not much motivation behind the Fatal Five. Exactly. You know. Yeah, that, I think that's my greatest objection to this because the Fatal Five should be one of the more potent adversaries in the Legion lineup. Yeah, and here they're they're really not. Uh, I I question em the Emerald Empress's leadership and tactical abilities um be, uh, mostly for the fight scene like i said it's very individual instead of a, a group effort uh but why did she choose these particular people uh is it for their powers is it is it because they're just willing to go along with whatever she wants as opposed to getting you know the, the right people the the right mix of people in her group even though they may challenge her some uh, you know, there, I'm 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 putting a lot of a lot of uh, motivation and explanation uh, onto this character that we've not seen. You know, it's not been shown to us, so it's <laughs> I'm I'm maybe uh, my complaints are maybe um, overwrought <laughs> at the very least. Well, I think I think it it speaks to some of the things I've been thinking about with the sensor girl stuff in this issue, like on page four when Brainy and them are talking about you know, following the trail of Sensor Girl. Uh, everybody's worried she's going to be joining the Fatal Five. And we've seen scenes like with Shrinking Violet and Lightning Lass trying to investigate um, this formation of the new five. We act, we saw a confrontation between Emerald Empress and Sensor Girl back in issue 21, I think, or 21 or 22, where 
Emerald Empress gave her, you know, gave anybody just an open invitation, like come be a part of my, my team. So, so, mm-hmm. so the, the, this formation of a new Fatal Five has been developing next to this mystery of Sensor Girl because the big fear was, oh no, she's going to join the Fatal Five. Mm-hmm. But I think it it was spoken more than it was shown that yes, yeah, like like even in this in the in that page four, you know, I wrote here. Everybody's just assuming that she's going to join the Fatal Five, but why? It's not like she would. It's not like she was evil towards the Legion. She just had a secret, and she she was just mysterious. And but she wasn't mysterious in a bad way. She was helping them out in their missions. She was obviously very knowledgeable about science. Um, uh, so she was causing. Obviously, she was causing some tension, and that led to Element Lad saying, okay, you know, can you please just tell me everything's okay? And she's like, well, you know, thank you. I actually think very highly of you now, but I'm going to go. But that, she didn't say like, she wasn't like Nemesis Kid or somebody like, you didn't make me a legionnaire, so I'm going to kick your ankles. You know, like, (laughs) none of that happened. Right. But yet they're all like... Oh no, just because we've been told by Levitz that this Fatal Five is forming, they're trying to make the connection. I don't know. That's the that's the stuff that kinda I feel got lost in that first half, where they're saying she's gonna join the five. But there's nowhere on the page did we ever get the sense that Sensor Girl was bad. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that's <clears throat> I feel the same way you do with some of the characters. I, I think I think we're too far along into Legion history and Legion comics by this point to get a character like Caress, who was only about acid, and and kind of go, really? Like, we already had, unless they're trying to do a mono thing, but it's like we already had ma- mono. Yeah, I, I was going to point that out, too. It, it's exactly it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a replacement. Yeah, so... Flair's kind of cool because I like her design, you know, like, okay, I, I get that, you know, she's not far off from like a solar uh, sun boy or something, but, mm-hmm. but that's not strange, you know? So, um, yeah, I don't know who actually came up with these characters. If it was, if it was LaRoque, if it was Levitz and LaRoque, you know, you think of like, no, nah, I'm doing it again. I'm sorry. I said earlier, I didn't want to do this, but you know, when Lytle <laughs> was creating Telus and Quizlet and had some real thought behind Mentala and um, the redesign of some of those costumes. You know, those are pretty cool characters and pretty cool mm-hmm. concepts. Um, if this is LaRoque going, all right, uh, I'm going to do an, an acid girl. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't land quite as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like Empress is, is uh, dredging the bottom of the barrel when it comes to recruits. <laughs> Hey, and maybe that's her fault. Yeah. Maybe she's not a good leader, you know? Exactly. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. She is she is she is the horrible team leader. Uh which which only means that I expect that this group will not last. Uh unlike the predecessing group, predecessor group, uh, where like I said, the that team had been around for decades. Uh and 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 um uh, menacing the legion and 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 the legion worlds you know for for years and yet i i don't see any longevity to get back to your original question what do i think about this fatal five um i don't see any longevity longevity with this team the, this this uh this makeup so i i fully anticipate down the road that we'll get a return of uh Thorak and mano and validus at some stage and the, the the old fatal five will be back with a vengeance on some cover down the road <laughs> and to be fair, we did see Mono in this issue, and he true, true. He was uh, easily handled. Yeah, uh, uh, nice, nice pun. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mean that. <laughs> <laughs> but there, in that, when when the team is on Shanghala, and Mono just happens to be there, you know, um, uh, there's another art thing though, because Laroque draws him with two discs, one on each hand. I wondered about that too and he's supposed to only yeah. have one mm-hmm. and the dialogue is like reflecting the fact that he only has one but he's being drawn as two so 
I, you know, I don't, that's a little bit of a, that's a, that's, it's not a huge mistake, but I can't just say it's a small mistake either. Um, whether yeah. it's LaRoque not, I mean, the who's, he could just grab the who's who, right? Like we're past <laughs> that issue anyway. Um, or Berger should be like, oh, yeah, no, he's only got one. So just tell the colorist, you know, color over that second one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that yeah, somebody that was somebody missed something there for sure. Yeah, but I will say, uh, since we were talking about mono um, and the and the art, I I like besides that that uh, uh, screw up there, the way that his his face his head is drawn within his bubble. Um, looks a lot more, I don't know, menacing, alien than I think we've seen him in the past. I, I'd have to go back and look at, at previous uh, appearances, but my recollection was is that we've not seen uh, such an expressive uh, mono before, you know, in terms of his face. So I, I, and it's, we only see like a, just a, a few panels of it, but I just, I, I just really dug it. thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, very ghoulish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and that's a, I actually like that sequence too, art wise. You know, other than the mistake, I like the mm-hmm. some of the action with between Brainy and yes and Mono. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're just kind of bouncing around. So, I mean, the, what, <laughs> where do you want to go to next? What you, I mean, you, we can go big, we can go small, whatever you want. Uh well, so I think we should. Maybe we should cover everything else about the issue and then delve into the the sensor girl stuff okay. at the end. Um, let's see here. Usually my notes are more or less uh, uh, chronological in the issue, so uh, that as we as we as the legionnaires leave Earth, like I said, I mentioned that on page three that 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 wonderful Dawn Star uh, near splash page, but we get that conversation between the legionnaires, and this is this is where you mentioned the, the also the kind of the well, here's all the exposi- expositional stuff that we've already read before, but just in case you've forgotten or you're new, here's all these things that we've heard from these characters before, um, such as Timberwolf. But I, I did find in that scene that uh, Brainiac 5's comment about Sensor Girl being, you know, uh, very curious. You know, he says she is dangerous to us and to herself. And so that kind of goes to what you were, what you were discussing uh, or mentioning before about about uh, the the team and and the, the the motivations they have for accusing her or just just assuming that she's going to join the Fatal Five, but I thought that was his choice of words was interesting. Her being dangerous uh, to them that makes sense if they believe that sh- that she's off to join the Fatal Five. But why is it she dangerous to herself? And if you tie that into his belief that she is Supergirl. What does that mean? Uh, I, I it just it was just it's something that just stuck out to me, and I don't. For what is shown here, I don't understand why he would say that. What's his motivation for this? And one of his mem- team members calls him out on it too. She's right. Whoever says well, we don't even know who she is, so how can you say that? Mm-hmm. So I did like that at least one of the other members called him out on it, but then they didn't really follow up on that conversation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's 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 been a lot of my frustration for this, these kinds of things is that uh, Levitz kind of throws them out there, and then we don't get the next scene with the characters discussing these things, you know. But it, I mean, it doesn't really matter because nothing really changes between that page and then later when you know, other characters or, or even these same characters are discussing this situation. It's just things, you know, in a very soap opera way, things are moving forward, but also remaining very static. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes any sense. No, it does. Uh, you almost wonder if like this should have been, I mean, it's already oversized because they're doing more pages anyway uh, with this new format, right? But you almost feel like it should have been like maybe it should have been thirty eight pages or something. Oh yeah, just to kind to of flesh. It. Yeah, just to flesh it out a little more. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, well, if we stick with let's stick with the that because there's like three different groupings of legionnaires mm-hmm. in this issue, right? 
So, and this is the one that's following Sensor Girl's trail, led by Brainiac Five, um, deputy leader, um, but also the one that we've been following closely anyway in some previous issues. Um, and you sort of just hit on, uh, I mean, you already hit on what where his motivations are. He just wants this information. Um, it's one of the the lines, it's one of the little uh, notes that I have for myself from a from a statement you said in one of our previous episodes. What the reaction of Brainiac 5, what is that going to be like? And now we clearly didn't get that this issue. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, when they get, when he learns that Ultra Boy was able to see into her costume and nothing was there. He gets, is that the scene where he gets the, or is it the next one? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. No, it's that one. Yeah. He says empty, but, but that's not possible. And he's, he's very confused. <laughs> right. And then when they go to Shanghala and they, they, Dawnstar, uh, finds out that, you know, that's where the trail led, but then it simply vanishes. And then he says, of course, what a fool I've been. So you almost get the notion yeah. that he knows. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. I'm like, all right, well, why? <laughs> why does he get the notion if he does know that it's Projectra mm-hmm. outside of, uh, I don't know, it, it was just an illusion they were following? It was a it was a fake trail? I, I, I don't think it was because it makes sense that if, if, if they were following Sensor Girl to Shanghala, she's visiting Karate Kid. Right, because that's mm-hmm. that's one of the panels that we got in that Monel issue in issue twenty three, where she's in the Hall of Dead Heroes looking at Karate Kid. So, mm-hmm. I'm 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 curious to. This is something I guess we're going to have to wait until next issue to see if it actually plays out. But, um, is is that all it is? Unless you know, like, is that all it is? It's just that she was a phantom, a vision, a, a, an illusion. And that's what they were following. So he's like, oh, right. There's only one Legionnaire that I, there's, well, he wouldn't even know it was a Legionnaire. Exactly. That, that's the problem I have with that, that, uh, that supposition is because, you know, he lives in a universe where there are at least 25 individuals who have these special abilities, but it's filled with, with the United Planets that has worlds of people that have special abilities. So yeah, Given the clues that we have been presented, it seems it's it's uh, well, I, I guess in my notes I had it's it's very Holmesian. <laughs> the way that that Brainiac Five goes from surprise at this this um, detail, this clue, to just a little bit later, there's another there's another uh, uh, event, and that leads him to automatically know who who the or know the identity of sensor girl hmm. uh, i think the author is playing a little fast and loose with the clues at this point and and brainiac five is is kind of the like i said the, the Holmesian character here uh and <laughs> this is just a personal thing i always hated that that bit where the detective just pulls the the answer out of out of the ether and then we're then we get the reveal of well based on this and this and this here's your here this this makes sense but as of now it doesn't make sense and so i just i just i react (laughs) just automatically react negatively to things like that the only thing i could maybe think is okay you know he does have superior intelligence sure and he's and he you know like a mentat he's putting it all together you know the idea the the notion that she has a hollow globe of a destroyed planet or a planet that's no longer there. She affects the senses. I'm, I'm throwing this out and I hope that this isn't residual memory, but I'm also wondering if this notion of this character being able to travel so far and then just disappearing, did she steal the technology that Zamir created to teleport Orando? in the first five issues because she did make her planet disappear again. Right. She told the Legion go away. Uh, I'm, I'm taking my planet to another, uh, 
or, or it was assumed that the planet, it didn't go back to our space. It kind of just went away, right? I think. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that's that's what I recall as well. Did she incorporate that technology into her being? I don't know. I'm, I, I can't remember. I don't remember the next couple issues. I'm just sort of trying to think like Brainiac 5. Like if something just disappears, the, they do have technology that can do that and they have people that can do that. But what's been the most recent example of that? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I guess it's Orando. I guess. I don't know. So... Yeah, I was a little frustrated by that. It felt that scene; those scenes felt a little cat and mousey. Um, you know, you got a, a mention, like you said, between Dawnstar and Wildfire, just to make sure that everybody knows that there's tension between those characters. I did like the little bit where Brainiac stops at Invisible Kid's tomb. Um, I have to assume because here, this is part of that knowledge that is missing in my brain. Were they really good friends because they were scientists? Or am I thinking of their relationship post-Zero Hour where Lyle Norg was a, a, a really strong member of the Legion team and he was played as a scientist and, and Brainy and Lyle had some kind of relationship? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't know if you had I, any thoughts. To I, I, I don't know specifically, but I, I kind of think that this is a, a retroactive um, situation where... Levitz is extrapolating this friendship based on their 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 scientific pursuits. Right. So I mean, I I, I love that little detail, um, even if it hasn't been earned uh, throughout the the Legion stories through the years. But uh, it sounds like they picked up on that in later incarnations of the Legion. So that that'd be nice to to read once I get to those two. Um, and then there's a a, a small little sequence with a, yet another team. Where, where they're creating this giant emerald, oh boy! In hopes of, t- <laughs> in hopes of using it to find Emerald Empress. Um, to to find or lure her. Oh. Uh, either way, it wasn't my favorite sequence in the I, book. Yeah, I didn't get that at all. It was just like, what? Is she? Do do they think the Emerald Empress is like like the equivalent of a of, of a moth to a flame? And and the, this Emerald is that? I just like what is this? I guess because they were trying to recreate the energies, that's why I was like thinking they're just trying to give the science police something that could act like a, a homing device or something. Oh, okay. I maybe. I mean, they do. They do uh loaded up on onto the ship i it just still it i don't know I, I there's something missing here and and boy if they don't give us something this next issue <laughs> i'd be really uh irritated about this scene yeah i don't i don't know if they do i thought it was just levitz's way of going hmm i need white witch needs to do something she hasn't yeah, done exactly. something in a while yeah. And, and block, you know, yeah. uh, or, or, or his favorite, you know, lightning lash, she's got to do something in the issue. So here she is energizing this thing. Right. Uh, I even, I even did think though, Peter, that, you know, maybe, maybe this is a lure by why, why would they make a, a giant emerald as opposed to this? But, you know, maybe, maybe it's supposed to suggest a, another emerald eye of Ekron that would, would, would lure her to them. Because of the energies, I don't know. It, it hmm. it's just it's just really clunky and and pointless, really. And it's the only time we see that that grouping too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think some of the artwork here too is this is where the I was reacting to some of the artwork, like Block lifting that emerald is not strong, and and he just putting it onto like two little hooks <laughs> on the front of a ship. Like I felt like it's the 30th century. That should be a little bit more, yeah, <laughs> interesting in its connection. Um, now here's the other odd thing. Since that's really the only scene we get with them, and we've covered Brainiac's team, Brainiac Five's team, in the Tales reprint, they take out the second Shanghala scene. 
because the Tales reprint can only have so many pages, right? So they cut the second time we go back to Shanghala, where Dawnstar once again tries to find, or, or where Dawnstar reveals that the trail has ended. So we don't even get Brainiac 5 saying, of course, you know. Um, we get the mono thing uh, and the fight and all that, but then that's the last time we get, uh, oddly enough, they cut those the, the, next, the next sequence, right? So my brain was then going, why? They should have cut this whole emerald thing. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Like, it, 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 that part of it doesn't really mean anything to the larger story. So I thought that was weird. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, we got to cut two pages. I mean, that brainy thing is not, it's not like it's monumental, but he is a driving force behind this mystery. It's, he's the one being most affected by it, you know, in, in many ways. So... Very strange. Very as I was comparing the two, because I actually have that issue. I have issue three fifty. I was like, you know, going through the pages, and I was like, oh, I skipped something. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't. They cut that sequence. Weird. Well, uh, a page they didn't they didn't cut, and the reason I'm bringing this up is I totally forgot to mention this in the synopsis. <laughs> Uh, it was a blink and you miss it page, uh, maybe. Um, but we get we get the the scene here at the the meta complex uh, where Ron Badar is uh, supposedly recuperating, and uh, one of the doctors it's revealed to us that um, he's under the sway of Universo. So uh, I just want to make sure, just in the interest of completion, I wanted to uh, mention that little bit. That's just tossed in here to to remind us hey there's there's this other plot that's going on yeah and if i put on my my editor hat um it's kind of weird because we saw ron vidar in in the legionnaires 3 miniseries and he was wide awake because remember they went to him to go get a time cube right Right, and then we get that scene with uh, with Saturn Girl and uh, Element Lad mentions their little adventure. Yeah, but but if he's in a coma here, see what I'm saying? He's the the timeline. Ron's timeline is all wonky. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I guess it depends on how how much time has passed between uh, Legionnaires Three and and this issue, or the story where he got he got hit. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Right. Yeah. Which was what two issues ago? Uh, might have been more. I think it was like twenty twenty one or twenty two. Okay. Because then I also have in my notes that in in twenty two he was they were visiting him and he was awake, and now he's back in. Unless it's unless it's the doctor messing around with you know. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's a little, a little bit of confusion going on of like, how severe is this injury that Ron Vidar is supposed to have? Unless it is, um, I wrote here, Doctor Fauci, uh, Doctor Fashir. <laughs> uh, you know, is he messing around with his recovery? Which is yeah true, which is obvious. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah like there's another page they could have cut out of the tale. Yeah, more than the other one. So. Um, let's do the third team. Yeah, the Stratus team. Yeah. So this is the group that, uh, manages to actually deduce, um, a connection between Mentala and Emerald Empress and, and just happens to go follow a lead for Mentala and it leads them to the Fatal Five. Um, I'm a little confused with last issue, the Fatal Five, they were on a different planet, but also kind of had the same thing where it was all like wealthy estates, but it mm-hmm. was called mm-hmm. something else, like Starshire or something like that. And now we're at Strata. Uh, you know, minor point, but some of the design element looked the same, so I got confused. But anyway. Yeah. Um but we got a couple things here, you know, a couple scenes with Telus, a, a thing on Titan. Um, and like I said, this is the group that actually confronts them. 
Um, do you have any thoughts about this this little section of, of teammates? Uh, not not that much. Uh, I I did like how Colossal Boy, who, if I remember correctly, was uh, a science police officer or a, or a candidate mm-hmm. before he joined the Legion. And so I like how he's kind of leading the investigation with this group. And he's pushing to, because uh, there's that interesting scene between him and Dream Girl, or this bit between them, uh, where she says, may I, may I remind you, Element Lad reluctantly let you come here, Colossal Boy, and only because we're dropping, we were dropping the Restorer on Titan for treatment anyway. He may not, and then she, or he interrupts her. I'll talk, I'll talk him into clearing another trip. And he's like, come on. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 I, I, like I said, it, I liked seeing Colossal Boy be more than just, you know, the big guy that, that, um, uh, is usually just shown overpowering his opponents or not as <laughs> probably more often not. Um, you know, he, he's got, he's, he's got this training, he's got this history and more importantly, the kind of the interest in, in being a detective, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, because the resident detective, Chameleon Boy, is pretty much out of action when it comes to this whole thing, other than the uh, little uh, discussion he has with Element Lad. Mm-hmm. But that's more, like you said before, expositional and, and throwing us some some uh, tidbits that we were, we've already been uh, privy to. So it's it's nice to see these uh, other legionnaires taking on these other maybe minor roles that other characters have, have usually been afforded in the stories. So I, I I really like that bit. And then like I said that thing with between him and Dream Girl, it's like Dream Girl always has come across to me as at least in recent issues as someone who doesn't mind bucking the system and going her own way and yet she is the voice of i don't know the establishment in this scene i i just it was weird to to see that it, it seems a little incongruous to what we've been shown about her before um unless and so here i'm extrapolating she just thinks this is a waste of time and she's like she just wants to get back home for some reason <laughs> i don't know i wrote that in my notes too like where's her impulse why yeah. why is she following rules and regulations at this point um the only thing i could sort of think is it wasn't her idea yeah exactly <laughs> i think i think that is a very good extrapolation there yeah, yeah. <laughs> i and then oh, go ahead i want to follow up on the colossal boy thing because um yeah you're right like i i like that at, you, you saying this whole detective thing um is starting to make sense especially if 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 the Legion lore of him and Cam being friends, being good friends, you know, maybe some of that would rub off on him, you know, this, this mm-hmm. notion along with the science police thing. So I, I think those are great observations that you had. Um, I always like when you get to see Colossal Boy uh, use his powers in such an offensive way where he just, he's just, you should be afraid of Colossal Boy, right? Oh, yeah. He, the way he goes after Persuader in that battle um, reminds me of um, reminds me of the issue where they find out that Shrinking Violet had been uh, kidnapped and replaced. And there's a sequence where they go after her uh, where she's in like a med tank or something like that. And Colossal Boy is just he's like ripping through the floor and and punching walls and i think one of the legionnaires is like um somebody better calm him down because he's he's mad Mm -hmm. and uh you almost get the sense that he probably is growing bigger than he ever has before um and then of course there's the battle that he had with duplicate boy over shrinking violet who wasn't really shrinking violet at the time that was from some earlier issues like when he comes a knocking and starts growing and is going to step on you and punch you and swipe that big, like, yeah, that should be scary. That should be scary. So he gets a little bit of a spotlight here, which is nice, or or at least he gets some action. Um, yeah. 
Whereas you get someone like Starboy who's barely done anything in this entire volume and is just part of that one sequence that is doesn't make sense anyway, you know. But it's nice to see at least uh Levitt's focusing on someone else. Mm-hmm. As you uh, exactly. Maybe maybe that's what I'm reacting to in part because uh I I feel like we've been getting you know, the spotlight on a lot of the same characters throughout the, the various stories that or plot lines that have been going on. Mm-hmm. And Colossal Boy is this nice, uh, refreshing little change in this. The other thing I liked about the sequence on Titan um, is in that narration box where uh, they talk about uh, well, first of all, who ever thought we would get another mention of the Restorer? I mean, wow, I'm surprised. Color me surprised about that. So in the narration, they say, uh, you get the notion that um, when when mentalists, when, when people from Titan go off-world, uh, they have to stay in constant sort of communication, which is what, what the Legion team is trying to go after, these discs that have um, some kind of connection to Mentala or to all Titans, um, but that they have to pay back some of what they earn to whatever institute that is that they learn from. Uh, I just thought that was an interesting little, you know, Paul Levitson kind of uh, exploration into a planet, into a society that makes mm-hmm. them different from ours or make, or some kind of like mirror to what maybe Levitz thinks our society should do, or I don't know. <laughs> you know, I just thought that was really interesting. And then you get that quote underneath it, you know, think twice because you never know who's listening the first time or whatever. Yeah. Like those are great. The, I, I really like those caption boxes. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's one of the things I've always loved about, uh, I think I've mentioned this before about like the Encyclopedia Galactica entries that we get. Or other things like this that we're we're seeing, um, it just it's a nice little, just a little tidbit that that better defines or introduces uh, uh, ideas that where the, it just makes this this universe feel a lot more um, lived in or or encompassing or just different. And yeah, I totally agree. This it's it's great little bits of information that we get there, and is much better in terms of expositional knowledge than the some of the dialogue that we're getting in this issue. Yeah. Plus, the other thing too, I think it it fights, it helps to fight the notion that, you know, Saturn Girl is a blonde white woman, right? Oh, but really, she's also from Titan. And they do have some alien, quote unquote, alien aspects to them. Things that maybe we don't understand. Like, what is it like to live with telepathy? A whole society who has telepathy, right? Mm -hmm. And we get elements of that when it comes to, say, uh, well, Polar Boy even kind of talks about it later, too, where he's like, oh, hey, tell us if you like that, you should come come out to the, what do you call them? The, the outer worlds or whatever. Um, the colony worlds. That's right. He's like, yeah, he mentions the colony worlds. And uh, uh, that's something that they would play around with like in the, in around zero hour or before with the, with the Valor series where all of those people, anybody who, any planet that everybody shares a power is probably a colony world from earth because their metagene kicked in, or I don't know, whatever. I forget what the whole story is behind the Valor series, but yeah, that he seeded all these planets. Um, so I like that. It, it kind of makes them alien, quote-unquote alien, when really they just look like they could all be from Earth anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. So th- those, little, those little dialogue things, like you mentioned – that's the Levitt stuff that I like and that was yep. missing a lot from some of those early pages. Um, but it's good that we just got a few things, especially with Polar Boy. You know, like when he goes racing into the fe- uh, into the battle, he's one of those characters that we haven't seen much of either um, outside of his introduction as a member. And But what was nice was even though they're like, hey, don't do that. It's the Fatal Five. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm cool. I'm just going to engage. I know you're coming. Believe me, I'm not doing this by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I 
which is great because he's a veteran, right? Like, even though he's new to the team, he is a veteran. He's a, he's a superhero. So I liked that yeah. little bit of um, personality. And uh, well, speaking of Polar Boy, you know, there's uh, on the on the scene with in, on Titan, um, you know, this is just a little throwaway thing, but uh, the uh, the person that's there assisting them, it, it seems like there's some uh, interplay between those two characters. So you know, <laughs> maybe Polar Boy is you know going to get going to get a girlfriend. I don't know. It's just it's just I, I I like little things like that, even though they're like I said, they're just they're just throwaway. Uh, maybe just uh, just to show that Polar Boy's there. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what, exactly what the point of this is, except for um, maybe something will come out of this. Yeah. Um, if I stick with this team for a little bit outside of the Sensor Girl stuff, um, I did like the LaRoque pages of art, page 18 and 19, when the ship was being... Or no, I'm sorry, not that. It's pages wherever the ship gets destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought those were some neat. Those were some fairly well designed pages with all the debris and um, rushing into the fight scene. There was some good energy behind it, as we've been yeah. talking about it, and some good uh, facial expressions going on here too. There's right before the ship is basically destroyed there's just I, there's a really cool shot of ultra boy um you know yelling to everybody to get out but i i thought that was w- really well done and dream there's another uh, on the next page with dream girl her reaction just very well done um but then we get you know like the next page with with the fight and it's just little bodies in here um and uh, not really, not really anything to to crow about, I guess, in terms of the art. But, <laughs> but yeah, good stuff in in some of these sequences. Uh, do you want to talk about Element Lad? His his two scenes, or his, or yes. especially the scene with Saturn Girl. What do you have for that sequence? Those sequences. Saturn Girl. I gotta I gotta find that page. Hold on. That's all right. I mean, the first sequence we kind of talked about. It's really just him and chameleon oh with cam yeah Yeah. and they're just kind of kicking around everything that we've been talking about you know there was something about that scene if you don't mind jumping back to that sure um so like i said chameleon boy is has been kind of the 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 legion detective for for a while now and he's uh, from my perspective been sidelined like i said uh but then he he says these things here um uh he says, it's a pity Sensor Girl turned out to be such a distraction or to be a distraction at such a critical moment. I hope she hasn't joined the Empress. Okay, fine. That's That goes back to the expositional stuff. This is what I thought was curious. And I thought she was a Supergirl clone Brainy had created. And I'm like, what? Where, where, where did this come from? Well, they, it just, they did have that <laughs> argument, the sure didn't he and didn't he even say something about like well you've been known to do rash things or something like yeah but i mean the the idea of 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 brainiac 5 cloning a fellow member <laughs> i don't know that's that just that has such potential and and weight to it that is but it's it's just this throwaway line it's like it's like it's like comedian boy just just like eh, you know here's this thing this straight thought i thought of i'm just gonna say it but then you know, they, then they drop it. It's just I don't know. It just it had there, there's there's potentially so much to that that they could have done uh, in the previous issues to even suggest that Brainiac Five was behind Sensor Girl in some way. And I don't know. It just, or maybe it's maybe it's as messy as it is as it sounds as I'm saying it that they didn't want it to go down that route. But I don't know. I just it's like wow, that's that's a really interesting uh, plot point uh, that just kind of appears out of nowhere maybe i don't know i i i just thought that was kind of weird um cam doesn't think and, think much of brady well that's that's interesting yeah he yeah exactly it's the and and that's it's things like that it's like wow uh, we're really getting at least the suggestion of some group dynamics 
in here that uh, I wish they would really play up more. Uh, it This being, like I said, soap opera-esque, that makes perfect sense for them to do things like that. But I, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the these comics are more or less plot driven more than anything else. So I, I can see why they wouldn't uh, delve too much or, or spend too much uh, page real estate on those kinds of things. So I, I just went back to issue 24 and he does bring that up in front of Brainy's face. He's, the cloning thing? Yeah. He says, I was afraid oh, wow. you had created a Supergirl clone. Oh, then whoops. again, you've been known to do such things <laughs> unconsciously when you were approaching a breakdown. Yes. Yeah, I remember that part. I I totally forgot about the clone thing. Whoops. Um, I'm gonna Peter. I'm gonna blame the. Uh, I mentioned the accident oh, uh, earlier at the top of the. <laughs> I got a I got a concussion, and you know that kind of plays around with your memory. So, <laughs> I won't I won't let it be the fact that I am getting older and my memory is not what it used to be. So <laughs> no, I think it's still just. I think it's still <laughs> a fair point though because it shows you just how divisive everybody has become or just on edge because of sensor girl and that's true what is the one thing you do with your friends when everybody's annoyed at each other you go right to the thing that annoys you about mm. them mm -hmm. with brainy it just happens to be that he likes to create things that kill legionnaires <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so i don't blame that's, that's fair i don't that's blame cam <laughs> although element lad does say what does he say something like Oh, you know, well, he's been known to go crazy, but he's not going to, he won't do that anymore. It's like, well, I don't know about <laughs> yeah, that's, that. That's being a little too fair to Brainiac, I think. Yeah. But anyway. All right. So, uh, Garth residence. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that sequence. So, well, the, the first thing I, I put in my notes was, you know, there's a Legionnaires three reference. So you get, even though maybe the, uh, the, the timeline might be a little wonky, like you suggested earlier. Uh, I just I like that that little bit of hey, we're tying this to this other series, um, you, uh, even though it's it's oblique. It's you know it's not like they put in a, an editor's note. Hey, go read Legionnaires three. Um, but I like that. Uh, we we already touched on uh, the, the 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 clue drop that Imra gives us about she was already a legionnaire. Um, mm -hmm. I thought, well, the, the and the other thing about this scene I thought was really interesting, and but has nothing to do really with with uh, the plot of this issue, <laughs> is how much. Uh, well, I guess the the interesting relationship between Imra and Garth, because Garth is very much the he's he's the dad, uh, the um, uh, not the dad. Obviously, he's a dad. What's what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, parent? he seems to be yeah, the parent. Yeah. He seems to be taking care of, of Graham a, a lot, or he's, I don't know. He's, he seems very comfortable in this role and, and, and element lad comes to talk to them, but it's Imra that he's, he's focused on. And she, uh, I don't know. I, I put in my notes that she seems to wear the pants in the family and maybe, and that, I, I realize that's, that's a bit sexist. Um, but that's, <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, but she is definitely the like the elder statesman of the two between her and her husband, mm -hmm. and I really like that that dynamic. And granted, you know she was she was a longtime legion leader early on, and she's the one that that uh, vouched for Sensor Girl when she came to join the legion. Right. It's all, so it's the, all, all on of her this shoulders. totally, yeah, it all makes sense uh, in regards to that. I just really liked that she is she has this this role in in uh in the legion now that she has and that element lad is you know getting her counsel on this thing so i i just i, I just like that dynamic and you just have to wonder what is going through element lad element lad's mind when she makes the revelation that she's been a legionnaire before Mm -hmm. the list isn't very long, right? Like if you think about who, what female member, if, if we're going to go very binary, if we're going to just assume that it is a female, right? Like, right. Mm -hmm. Because that certainly has happened before where it's been 
a male mass or female masquerading as a male or, you know, so mm, it could very true. easily go on the other way. Um, right. What's the list? There is no list. It's Supergirl. It's Duo Damsel. Mm-hmm. It's Projectra. The... I think that's it. That's it, it, right? <laughs> unless, unless you extrapolate maybe some other temporary members of the Legion, Legionnaires. Lana Lang. Yeah, that would have been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what about there's a scene of like Element Lad rushing to Brainy? I think it's Insect Queen. <laughs> that have been disastrous. Um, you know, uh, and then the the uh, and then the, another option would be just to pull a Legionnaire out of the hat, like like Kid Quantum later, right? Like just this random. Right. Oh, he's been a Legionnaire, but you didn't know about it. You know. Yeah, exactly. That would that would have been unfair. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. In terms of like anybody who hasn't read the Meanwhile column, that's big news. Yes, and and also still pumps the theory that it could be Supergirl. Mm-hmm. And then every- even though we're one, two, three, four, five pages away from the big reveal, right, right. But it's pretty cool. I I do wonder if that scene would have played better last issue. Yes. I was just I was just going to say that because Element Lad says, but tell me again, it was okay to make Sensor Girl a Legionnaire. So yeah, I think I think had this come before, that would have given given that reveal a lot more weight. Yeah, but then he or, or maybe he he would have had to act on it though, don't you think? That's true. Exactly. Um, yeah. The only thing I have left is all about just Sensor Girl. It's not much. Yeah. Um, I already mentioned, I think the reveal of Sensor Girl coming into the battle is kind of anticlimactic. Um, and the reveal of Mentala being the fifth Fatal Five member, which sort of makes sense given everything. You know, she disappeared from the Academy. Everybody's thinking Sensor Girl is going to join the Fatal Five. I think there might have been a mention last issue that Mentala could also join the Fatal Five. Uh, or maybe that, you know, that when Wildfire and them went to go visit the Legion Academy. Um, but her entrance into the battle also felt a little anticlimactic. I mean, the the, the buildup of her shrinking Colossal Boy down is cool. Yeah. But I would have liked to have seen a shot of her, like a, a, a different shot of her. Of like, yeah, a oh, little no. more... Her, and I don't mean this, you know, more more of a heroic pose type situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially especially since on page two, you know, it's built. It's like, oh, who's this? Who who's whose shadow are we seeing here? That and and the the four members of the Fatal Five. Who were who are they talking to? And then we get that that reveal here later in the issue, which is like you said, it's 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 not <laughs> it's not the most profound in it, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have some smaller notes uh, real quick. Uh, Empress calling Telus a monster, which says a lot about her. Um, you know, mm-hmm. there again, we're in a utopia, supposedly, but obviously there's still people. <laughs> you know. um, and just Sensor Girl showing that she's not a traitor right away. You know, like she. Uh, I feel bad for her in some ways because. The other le- some legionnaires were so quick to write her off because of her quote unquote actions, not her mm-hmm. actions, but what they deemed to be her actions or her personality. And it may be a, um, it may be a, a lacking in the whole who is sensor girl mystery that, um, there might have been other ways that Levitz could have created that strife and created that tension, a little bit more on the page rather than them just sitting around talking behind her back, which, you know, to be fair, is a very teen thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just like that she throws herself into the mix right away, calls on the other Legionnaires and says, come on, let's go, you know, let's go to battle. And, uh, and and you know, she's a Legionnaire. She's a Legionnaire through and through. Like, it, yeah. it, it, it's, I really kind of fell for her in this in these pages. Yeah, that that panel where she, like you said, she she 
rallies the troops and uh, Polar Boy says, already moving sense girl and thanks. It's, it's almost, I kind of read that as like, well, this is the, this is the, um, uh, the exhalation of the team being, uh, almost, almost to say, okay, we're with you. We got you. We're sorry. We got you. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I was getting, wanting to get at. Yeah. So I thought that was, you know, maybe not, uh, as earned as it could be or should be. Um, but I, it was nice, uh, a nice shorthand uh, that Levitz is employing here to move on, at least in this moment. Right. Because we got and it, we got issues to go yet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that it's, you know, it's one of the newer guys uh, that that uh, says the words. Well, it's her buddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Like part of the, the new five. Right. You know, that's that speaks a lot to him. You know, he's like trying to look out for one of his own. So. Now, now, does does Projectra have a uh, history with the Fatal Five? Do you know? Well, she, I, uh, boy, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she was part of the original in- introduction of of the Fatal Five. She was part of that story. Oh, that was okay. Because I, oh boy, I, I have to go back and look now. Um, but I, but I, I, my memory is, and we've already discussed how good my memory is. Uh, <laughs> that she was the one who went to get persuader mm. during during the um the sun eater incident okay so she was there she was because it was her karate kid nemesis kid and pharaoh lad who joined the legion at the same time right yeah i don't i don't remember that but <laughs> i think i think that's what it is uh, i'll take yeah i'll take your word for it <laughs> and then later when feral lad dies you know shortly thereafter they're part of that t- team obviously mm-hmm. i was just wondering if she had history um or if this is just levitt saying that her and empress because her and empress man when they talk i could read a whole issue about that cuz they just kind of they understand each other Obviously, and this is something I hinted at way back in issue 21 mm-hmm. or two, whenever it was, when they were talking to each other. And I kept saying, oh, listen to listen to the dialogue like it's an empress talking to a princess or a queen. You know, there's royalty there. Whether I mean, empress is just sort of like it's just a name. It's not like she really has a station, but. These are these are characters that are cut from like the same cloth that White Queen is cut from, you know. If the three of them got in, you could do a reality show with White Queen from the X Men, Emerald Empress, and <laughs> and Projectra, right? And it mm-hmm. would be like one of those Housewives of whatever. <laughs> they there's a way that they talk to each other. There's a way that they communicate to each other, and and I I loved that it still was here. To the point that, um, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a lot, but you know, Emperor saying, you know, you're not going to confuse the eye this time around. There's no escape. The game is over. The masquerade done. Bid farewell to life as you welcomed it. And then she, like, how does Empress know? You know, unless the eye figured it out. But yeah, I that I was that was the very question I was going to ask you. Um, was it? Well, here, before I get to that, just real quick, uh, to, to to punctuate what you were just saying, you know, that scene, that one panel that that you're not uh, all that impressed with where Sensor Girl enters the fray, mm. uh, but but we don't know yet, you know, really if she's with the Fatal Five or not. But Empress says, and now the final act as she's coming, right? And then we, you know, we uh, it's revealed that, oh, no, she's she's a legionnaire and all that stuff. But it's very her, her the Emerald Empress's choice of words with that and then what you were just what you just quoted um about the game and the masquerade done. It's very theatrical. Yep. Very yep. I don't know. Uh, uh, forgive me. Maybe perhaps a bit Shakespearean in tone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I love that about about uh the, the this character and the the relationship like you were saying between the two and it just, I really dig that stuff. And it, like you said, it's very mm, short or minor in, in this issue, mm-hmm. but it does continue that 
which we've already seen. And so it's a, that's a nice through thread that I really appreciate uh, between these two characters. I mean, and how ballsy is Emerald Empress to go, oh, here's Sensa Girl. I'm just going to act like I know she's going to join the team. She doesn't know that. Yeah. Right? Like, she's, uh, yeah, the whole. Well, her her hubris is that, well, of course she's going to join. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, she's see that's great. Like that's the stuff I wanted more of, and 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 maybe we'll get it next issue. Again, I don't remember the next issue, um, but if we're just talking about this issue, um, that's what made the second half of this book really sing for me. And um, that second to the last page before the reveal, I love the energy, the 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 firepower of the emerald eye, the way it's colored, the red and the green, the design of it. It's oddly got a little bit of a, a mirrored um, uh, composition to when Sensor Girl backhanded Emerald Empress three issues ago right. or whatever that was. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's got some nice symmetry there. And, um, and there's tension. The drama is there. Like you said, you could almost hear the music of her going, this is it. Boom. Da, 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 da. Masquerade's over. Bah, 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 bah. You know, like just <laughs> everything about it is so cool. Before we get to the last page, one question about um, Mentella. Did you know she was going to be the fifth member? Did that Was that a surprise for you? Did, or did you remember it from before? Or was that new for you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have any direct recollection that she was the new member. But given, given that I know that Sensor Girl was not, <laughs> uh, it was a fairly obvious question um uh conclusion okay i just but okay so go no go ahead no i i was just gonna, i just wondered if it if 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 that landed or what that was or you know did it mean anything to you so it, well yeah it probably landed the same way that that her reveal was for you in terms of the the actual reveal it's like well oh oh there she is yeah right okay <laughs> okay uh Okay, so I really want to talk to you about about the reveal, right? So it's the the dialogue from Emerald Empress seems to suggest she knew who Sensor Girl was. Mm-hmm. She's not surprised. Uh she's she's in fact that last page, the way you know, when she announces Projector and we see Projector there, the look on Emerald Empress's face is almost she's she's got this little smirk. And, like she's really pleased with herself, uh, but I don't. I don't take that as at all uh, as as a reaction of surprise. And so, I don't know. I. I does that add more weight to the uh, the relationship or that that connection? Uh, between the two characters or is it i don't know what does it does it pay off for you does it does it work i think it's interesting and i and it's it's the reason why i asked you if projector has any relationship with the fatal five you know um, in previous stories because you could probably just wrap it up that the eye when they first encountered sensor girl and the eye kind of wigged out and hid behind the empress that had to make Empress curious, like mm-hmm. what kind of powers does she have that sh- that this is happening, right? Um, what about Sensor Girl would make the eye do that? So maybe we'll learn next issue that Emerald Empress did a little digging and said, hmm, all right, I'm going to find out who this is and why. And that's why she's just like, all right, I know who you are. I know how to attack you now. So that your powers don't work. And and she gets the glee of revealing her in front of the other members. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where I think, really, you talk about her hubris. I know something the Legionnaires don't know. Mm-hmm. You know? So, uh, I think these are all great questions and we're just going to have to wait till the next issue. <laughs> 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 but I did, I find that this... Uh, Reading it now, after all these years, that's the connect. That's the thing that jumps out the most is the connection between Empress and Projectra. Whether I'm forcing it on there or it is there, 
or it's just a, a matter of consequence, right? Like of of these two characters who really didn't have history, but suddenly find themselves at different at, at odds, and it's kind mm-hmm. of interesting to me. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and the reveal is great. Like I love the artwork. You know, if I get if I oh yeah put my little teen teenage hat on when I read it, like she looks great. Yeah. Um, it didn't mean much to me because I hadn't read a lot of projector stuff. So it, 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 it probably, if anything, made me go, Oh, okay. Well, I wonder what, what this is going to mean. Um, and if you put all the clues together and all the, it, it, who else could it have been at this point, if it wasn't going to be Supergirl outside of, well, no, it couldn't have been Saturn queen because she was never a member, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I think it's, I think it's, I think it's fine. I think it, it, it works. It, you know, I, I'm, I guess we should go through maybe some of those clues and then look at some of the reader reactions from a pre, from a future issue to see what people thought. What other, did you have any other thoughts yourself though, in terms of the reveal? Um, no, uh, but I, I was curious. I don't know if this is the right moment to ask this uh of you though um because it's it's, this is so weird to to be reading this in hindsight you know reading it for the first time but already knowing the 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 big the big mystery um because i I was what i was trying to do was if i had been reading this as it was coming out what would i I, I don't think I would have guessed it was that it was that it would have been Projectra. I think I would have gone along with the idea of Supergirl, um, more out of a sense of getting around her death in Crisis and wanting that character to continue uh, in some way, especially in in with the Legion. So. Uh, I probably just would have, you know, blindly <laughs> accepted that possibility and not really entertain anything else. Um, so, and plus, I'm I'm not really good at <laughs> figuring out uh, clues in in narratives such as this. So, I tend to just kind of take in all the information and and try to form uh, a, a, a hypothesis. And I'm not always right. <laughs> so. I don't, I tend not to, to make the effort, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, uh, regardless. So, but I was curious, you know, how, how did you process this mystery? I think it just really was cool that there just was a mystery, you know, that it was this, who was this person? How is it going to turn out? Look how it's disrupting the lives of the Legion and having something to talk about if I did talk about any of it, I don't, I can't remember if any of my friends were reading it at the time um, or just reading about it in the letter columns, people guessing mm-hmm. like that's when comics can, can kind of go beyond that, you know, like think of the Judas contract, um, an ongoing mystery. Um, I know Kevin from, the, from, from the CGS crew used to always talk about in the eighties, there was a real mystery of who was Hobgoblin in the Amazing Spider-Man issues Mm -hmm. at the time and all these little secrets. And then it turned out to be one person, but, oh, it wasn't really them, you know, like it's, it's no different than who shot Jr. And, (laughs) and the mystery of, you know, I'm trying to pick things that happened in the eighties, you know, like what's up with Adam Chandler and all my children and why is he mean one day and the next day he's like your best friend, you know, and it turns out there was a twin, you know, like (laughs) that stuff is what it's why we got attracted to lost, you know, to be able to talk about these mysteries Mm -hmm. and, and you have people who, who, who really want the answer to be, to be something they've already thought of, or they, they want the end to be, more important than the journey, but really it ultimately is about the journey and how, how sensor girl affected all these characters. And again, this could be something we can table for when we read the next two issues where we're really going to start to get some of the reactions and, and some of the spill from this. Yes. Yeah. 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 Besides, you know, why did this happen? How did this happen? It's yeah, those relationships, you know, how does how does the the fact that she kept this from her fellow legionnaires in the way that she did, 
How does that impact her relationships with them? Yeah. Uh, wh- what does that mean for the team going forward? Is it is it going to be a healing moment or even an even further rifting of the team? Right. And the reactions from readers, you know, in the letter column in issue 31 about this issue, it's a letter column uh, of reactions from issue 25 and 26. For some reason, they kind of merge it. Um, so we don't get a lot, but, you know, we get one letter writer who says, you know, thank you for bringing Jackie back to the group. And when you think about Paul Levitt's track record, we talked about Lightning Lass. She had been away from the Legion for like a good year or two before he brought her back in the Baxter run, right? We've already seen what he did with Shrinking Violet. Even though we saw Projector in the first five issues of the Baxter run, she was not a member of the team since she got married to Karate Kid way back in, what, uh, Legion Annual number two, I think it is? Mm-hmm. Um, so she's been away from the team, too. So as far as Levitz goes, this is what he likes to do. He's he's redefining this character. Um, he took the opportunity when they decided it couldn't be Supergirl anymore, which which really kind of, in a way, is its own way of doing exactly what he did with Shrinking Violet. Um, it's very similar to what John Ostrander would do later with Barbara Gordon, right? Take her, her demise in The Killing Joke and turn her into Oracle. Well, there's Paul Mm -hmm. Levitt saying, all right, I'm going to take the demise of Kara, keep her safely in the 30th century, redefine her, make her the center girl character. Oh, we can't do that. All right. Well, you know who else it would fit? And I, and I think it sometimes fits even more is Projectra. She has a very real need, I think, to prove herself again, um, to put herself back into a place to maybe honor Val, you know, maybe honor her dead husband, Mm -hmm. um, to get back at, I don't think it's pure revenge driven, or maybe it started out that way. I guess we'll find out. But, um, I think, I think it really works on, on a writer level. Like Levitt's damn man. He took a, a missed, he took an opportunity in, in, in not being able to use Kara. Um, to still make the story make sense. It's not like the switcheroo of like Armageddon 2001 where it was supposed to be Captain Adam, but then they made it Hank Hall, you know, the identity of Monarch. But that kind of felt empty and last minute. This didn't feel that way to me. It really does feel like it developed with with them kind of going, oh shit, what do we have to do? You know, but but they at least made it work. You know, no. so so let me interject here with with some stuff from the the Legion Companion book. Awesome. Um, so this is uh, this is an interview with Steve Lytle, uh, and he he was asked to tell tell us about Sensor Girl, and 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 he said Sensor Girl was mostly Paul's baby. Uh, he uh, Paul really wanted to keep as much of the older elements of the Legion as possible, and yet with the changes in the Superman universe, we were kept from using Superboy as much as we would have liked. We couldn't use Supergirl because she was going to die in crisis. It still hadn't happened yet, but we knew it was coming up. It was going to be eventually. It was going to eventually be published, and we knew she was going to die. So Paul thought, Steve, I want you to think of Sensor Girl as Supergirl having survived crisis, but she doesn't remember who she is, and her powers have been almost entirely wiped away, with the exception of her sensory abilities. So at the time, I think he was suggesting that she had heat vision. X-ray vision and super breath, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> she would have, she would have these powers that were thought of as Supergirl sensory powers, and that would be, somehow be Kara, Kara, Supergirl surviving and only known in the Legion. She would appear in the future and never return to the 20th century, so that we would still mourn her as dead. Uh, but a few issues later, or a few weeks, whatever it was, Paul says we can't do it. It can't be Supergirl. Jeanette Kahn laid down the law. She says if they die in crisis. They're dead. That's it. Nobody brings them back. Uh, But then we had this character that nobody knew who she was underneath the thing. We knew it was a mystery, but we had thought it was Supergirl. Now we're going to have to come up with uh, what could be the mystery behind Sensor Girl. And we really didn't know at the time 
and we didn't really know at the time I designed the costume who it was going to be. Paul came up with the princess projector thing entirely on his own. I didn't have any input into that at all, so Sensor Girl designed by me was Paul's baby all the way as far as motivation and personality and that sort of thing. All that I brought to the personality of the character was that I wanted her to carry herself with a sense of power, and maybe in a way this regal quality suggested Princess Projector. That's great. It's great. It goes to show yeah, there was a real confusion, <laughs> but they took... You know, Levitt's smart. Got to give it to him. He took he took the opportunity. I'm looking back at the um, Adventure Comics 346 where they first appeared, um, and it is it's Karate Kid, Projector, Pharaoh Lad, and Nemesis Kid. So this is you know a, a, mm, a little okay. a little bit before the Fatal Five eventually gets introduced, and then um, you know we get the death of Pharaoh Lad. But when you look at it's so odd to hear Lytle say that he. He developed this costume totally separate from Projectra. Because when you look at Projectra's costume in that first appearance, it's red and white. And she's got this collar and she's got these white gloves. Oh, that's right. It's very different from what we see her. It, it almost looks very sensor girlish in a, mm-hmm. in a Silver Age way. Um, and, I, wonder, I, wonder, I wonder if that was subconscious on his part. Right. Because she even she has a cape. Um, you know, I, I think I read what you read at some point before I heard that before. And I, I, but I wrote a note here cause this, this was one of the notes that I was saving was this notion of going back to, uh, um, projector, her first appearance in terms of her design and also of her powers. Like, I feel like her early use of powers is a little more familiar to sensor girl than maybe some of her later stuff, but I don't know if that's concrete. Um, And then, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's all, that's, that's, that's stuff that I guess it's being documented, you know, this whole switcheroo thing, but um, I'm glad to see that it didn't disrupt too much the, the contents of the book itself. Do you feel that way? Do you feel it has in some way? No, no. I the the only the only I guess remaining stray thought I have about this whole thing is, had it been Supergirl, what would have been the reaction from the fans, and and within within the story itself, you know, the the Legionnaires. It, 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 that would be an interesting thought experiment to extrapolate that. Um, not having, you know, obviously not having myself, not having read what comes next and how that impacts everything, uh, that that will be a thought that lingers, and I'll be mulling that over as I as I read through this. Um, like I said, I I would have I would have assumed it was Supergirl, uh, and and would have wanted it to be Supergirl, but my motivations for that are totally uh, inconsequential, and and. Uh, um, uh, has nothing to do with with the direction of of the story. So, uh, but I I don't know. I, I projector has always been kind of a except for her becoming queen and and everything that went that revolved around the Legion of Supervillains taking over Orando and her leaving. She's always been kind of a one of those background Legionnaires for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, now having her thrust into the spotlight as she as she has been as Sensor Girl, and now this reveal, now I'm very curious how this character will be, how I will take in this character, right, uh, going forward, right. It's and 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 this is sorry. This is this is something that Levitz has been doing all along with other characters. Lightning Last is the probably the most um obvious one maybe uh, uh not maybe um and also um shrinking violet right. and so maybe projector is like the next one that he's going to do something like that with right so that you know that development that progression of of his characterizations that's something that that really excites me as a reader yeah i mean it's it's so rare in comics where uh, not that projector has um 
not that she's like an A-list character by any means, but where a character is one thing for decades, becomes another thing, and then that second identity supersedes anything that happens happened before it, right? Think yeah. of Nightwing, Dick Grayson, Nightwing. I mean, we're going to reach a point where he's going to be Nightwing longer than he's been Robin <laughs> at some point. Yeah. I mean, I think Barbara Gordon absolutely has been Oracle longer than she has been Batgirl, at least the Silver Age Batgirl. You know, by the time mm-hmm. she became Oracle in the 80s, she wasn't Batgirl again until the New 52. So I don't know what, you know, I figure out the math there. But, um, and who's the only, well, I mean, you could almost say the same thing about Wally Weston when he became Flash. Um, I was trying to think if there were any Marvel characters that were the same way, where they started off as one thing and became another. You know, maybe Ms. Marvel becoming Captain Marvel, you know. Um, so here's a character, Projectra, with, within the corner of the Legion of Superheroes, who's becoming a whole other identity. And the second identity is going to mean more to the team than the first one ever did. At least in terms of exposure, I think like what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. I think that, I think maybe that's the other reason why, even though this, this storyline is not on the same level of like great darkness saga. uh, And you can't really pinpoint the exact issues where it starts and all that other stuff. um, I think that's why it has such a, a fondness in my brain anyway, because it's, it was fun and it's going to take this character into a new place. And now I get to read the, the consequences of all this. And like I said, I don't remember it. I don't remember a lot of this. I remember bits and pieces, but it's going to be really cool to see how Levitz uses this character and, and to see the reaction. So we'll go on that journey uh, together when it comes to everybody else in the Legion going, Hmm, sense girl, who is she? Why is she? Now the question is why sense girl? We got the who, now now we need the why. Yep. Yeah. Woo! It's a long time coming. Now, you have a list (laughs) from from issue 26. Uh, We should probably... uh, Do you want to... We're at two hours. Do you want to save it for next episode, or do you want to... I was thinking, yeah, we we should do that. Let's, Let's talk about that stuff next time. Great. That'll give us a little more to talk about in terms of the story and... Mm-hmm. So there's a list from from a, from issue 26 that Levitz wrote of all the clues inside on the page, like actually on the page. So we'll we'll go through that next episode, um, so we can move on here um, in this episode. So any other thoughts on this issue? Uh, no, I don't think so. I I I really dug a lot of the the stuff that's in this issue. Like I said, at the beginning, the, some of the art I really enjoyed. I don't know, just the whole thing. I think I think maybe, Peter, you said last time, that last issue really kind of gelled for you. Mm-hmm. And I, I f- kind of feel the same way with this one, Good. with this issue. So I don't know. It's just it, interesting that our, our um, uh, reflections on these things, how... how 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 they're turning out, I guess, yeah. <laughs> in terms of the, the art and the story and, you know, just the issue as a whole. Right. And, and, you know, as a wrap up to year two or the beginning of year three of this title, you know, it kind of makes sense. This is, this is, mm-hmm. I, there's definitely going to be almost like a, a, a line in the sand of here's all, here's pre who is mystery girl. And here's post uh, who is sense girl, excuse me, who is sense girl. Right. Like, Yeah. Yeah, so that that's what I'm it's looking a, forward it's to. It's a nice it's a nice demarcation. Right. Thank you. Okay, so let's move away from Legion of Superheroes issue 25, go to our other segment where we take a look at the Legion of Superheroes throughout the DC universe at the time when Legion of Superheroes issue 25 hit the stands, which means we're going to take a look at Who's Who issue 18 and Booster Gold number 7. Um we're taking a look at in Who's Who 18, Phantom Girl, Polar Boy, Prody and Prody 2, Pulsar Stargrave, and I have some notes on um, Phantom Zone and Professor Ivo. Ooh. Okay. 
Did I not mention that in my notes to you? I don't. I if you did, I forgot. Okay. So I apologize. No, no, that's all right. This <laughs> it's let's let's actually start with Ivo because it's just a throwaway. Um, so when we read the annual number one, who shot Laurel Kent? Oh, right. And, mm-hmm. and remember at the end, we were trying to, there was nothing in the story that actually um, dictated that the person behind um, the, the killing of all the descendants of the Justice League of America uh-huh. was Professor Ivo. Like it, it, they, they just surmised that it was one of their villains that was long lived, but they never really came out and said Professor Ivo. Now we right. certainly uh, came up with that ourselves and that's been part of the Legion lore but I remember us talking and saying, why does everybody, in, in a lot of stuff I found online, why do they just say straight out, well, it's Professor Ivo? Because in the book, yeah. it didn't. Exactly. Well, here in the who's who, yeah. that last little blurb, <laughs> yep, he was. they say he was the one behind uh, in the 30th century killing the descendants of the Justice League of America. So you're like, oh, okay, well, there you go. Now we finally get a definitive <laughs> answer. Not from the story itself, but from who's who. How weird. Which is, you know, they they did that a lot. They dropped information every now and then. So, it, yeah, it's it's really interesting how they how why they why they would do that, right? It's just this little tidbit in one issue of Who's Who, and it becomes this lore. You know, from our perspective now, what thirty years later, it's become this lore um, that uh, impacted a story that we we read and talked about. Uh, just you know, relatively recently. So yeah, that's that's so bizarre that they would just add these little things like that, right? And I because I can't imagine, but, but it's cool. Yeah, it, it's totally cool. But I can't imagine Levitz wrote that entry for Professor I. Oh no, right? Like yeah. it's, it had to be somebody, <laughs> maybe Jerry Conway or somebody a little more familiar with the Le- with the Justice League. But if the who's who is a way to kind of make corrections and fill in the mm. gaps, okay, th- fine. Yeah. That's what they chose to do. So that's the only reason why I threw him in there, because I thought that was a nice little connection to one of our previous conversations. Um, real quick, uh, the cover for Who's Who uh, by George Perez. And, uh, oh, I don't have it in front of me. I think there's a, a different inker, but I can't remember if it's Giordano or not. Um, yeah, it is. Oh, great. Okay, good. My memory's pretty good then. <laughs> When it comes to Perez, I, you know, sometimes I actually remember those things. Um, Polar Boys on the front. Pulsar Stargrave is, uh, has, you know, kind of like a nice little place on the cover. Prody, you can see the two Prodies riding Plastic Man, which is kind of funny. Um, and then Phantom Girl is being chased by General Zod, half Phantom, half, uh, you know, in our reality, so... Uh, not much in terms of the cover with with the entries that we're going to go through, but I just thought I'd shout them out real quick. And the letter column for this issue, they do mention the who's who in the Legion of Superheroes. And I love, this is totally a tangent, I love that they call out Dick Giordano for not including Prez in this volume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> people wanted Prez. And Dick Turner's like, nah, that's all right. I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as they say, please be aware that it was a hotly debated entry. <laughs> uh, just, uh, yeah, just the um, the uh, internal machinations of, of things like this, right? It's just that I find that stuff kind of fascinating. Yeah. All right. So um, here we go. Phantom Girl, Polar Boy, Prody 2, Pulsar, Stargrave. Where do you want to go? You just want to go in order? Give me your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you, you had Phantom Zone on there as a question mark. Did we not want I, I, to touch on that I one? I did. I mean, really the only thing they mentioned mon but that's kind of yep. it. I, I didn't really have any other notes on it. Did you have anything about the Phantom Zone entry? We could start there since it's little. Uh, yeah, that was the thing. I was just trying to figure out um, what the connection would be. Obviously, the mon one one is, 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 is the big one. But uh, there's also a story... This ties into Phantom Girl, um, where she is able to. I can't remember the issue now, and I didn't write it down. Uh, she she's able to go into the Phantom Zone. Oh right. Just just the because because this was something that happened in like the, like in the Adventure Comics era, 
So it was already established that she could do that. Right. And yeah, did, didn't we? Didn't you ask that question about the the the, the issue where Monel was mm-hmm. put back in the zone temporarily? Yeah, twenty three. She, she when we had that discussion, one of us mentioned like, oh, she she's like, oh yeah, and I'm gonna just engage that little side wrinkle in my powers, and I'm just gonna go right into the phantom zone. Yeah, and we were both like, okay. oh, is okay. Didn't know she could do that. <laughs> but yeah, so. So when I was earlier, when I when I mentioned uh, I was flipping through the adventure comic stuff, it was because of the Phan- Phantom Girl entry that it, that caused me to do mm-hmm. that, and that's that's where I found uh, whatever issue it was that I that I came across. Probably three twenty three, maybe. That sounds about right. Nineteen sixty four art by John Fort. Fort, that she can just enter and exit the Phantom Zone. So that was an established power. So that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. It makes me wonder, and I guess we're going back to Phantom Girl. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, it makes me wonder if if she, uh, besides being being able to go from her her native dimension to ours, or you know the Legions, and the Phantom Zone, is that uh, have they shown her being able to do that with other dimensions as well? Is is that really her power? Is not not to become immaterial, but to transverse uh, dimensional frequencies and and go into other areas because that would really make her a much more her power set to be much more interesting than just just becoming a phantom i think they when we talked about the time trapper remember there was that one story where a way to get around the iron curtain of time was to go through phantom girl's home world i think her home dimension Mm. it was something like that so it it, it's it's a fair um, deduction that her power should be able to... I, I kind of like that the only reason she can go through the Phantom Zone is because of the Phantom connection, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's really the only reason, because they live and exist at, as Phantoms. If she could, if she could be able to do that uh, dimensionally, um, it kind of makes her powers more into transportation or teleportation rather mm, than a true. phantom. Now where, what, what could be interesting is if she could go into, you know, the metaphysical world of like a purgatory or, yeah, or some kind of well, hellscape or something. Well, well, okay. Let's jump back to the phantom zone because this is, this is the one thing that I learned about the phantom zone that I did not know about was that it is the realm of the creature ether. Mm hmm. Uh, had no idea. Uh, so if that's the case, then it, it, it's almost as if she, you know, if you think of the Phantom Zone as some sort of um, limbo or, you know, hell dimension or whatever, then that is ruled by this demonic looking creature, uh, you know, that 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 seems to uh, suppose that she can do something like that. Yeah. So anyway, anyway I just thought that was that was an interesting connection that. So does that mean that her native, and I always I always hate trying to pronounce her native um, <laughs> dimension because it's, or, or planet or whatever, yeah. uh, but you know does that mean that it's somehow connected to Ether's realm in some way or it or it's I don't know it, it is I, I have more questions than I have answers here. Thanks a lot. Who's who? That's the issue. I referenced that issue of DC Comics presents. In that Monel story from Legion of Superheroes twenty three, uh, it was um, DC Comics presents ninety seven. Um, I don't even think it. I don't even think it had shipped when this Who's Who came out, or maybe it did. Where Rick Veach, who did the entry for for Phantom Zone in in this Who's Who issue, he does a story kind of like the Who uh, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, where he just creates a final story for the Phantom Zone. And the villains, and that's where this creature comes about. It might have some connections to the Phantom Zone. Wasn't there a Phantom Zone miniseries, the three issue miniseries from like the late seventies, early eighties? Um, mm. It might have some connections to that. But when I read that last DC Comics Presents issue, because I thought maybe it might have something to do with Monel, but it really didn't. That's where this whole thing is like, oh. It's a dimension with a creature and, oh, that's weird. And it actually has to do with like Superman in the future where Earth gets destroyed. It's 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 a what if issue, you know, 
but then they take it and put it here in who's who. And you're like, Hmm, all right, maybe there's more to it. Maybe there was a previous connection, but I don't think so. I think, I think, yeah. So I, well, the, the, the last paragraph of the Phantom Zone entry is the exact fate of the zone and ether's entire realm remains unknown, but there is another story to be told and soon. So it makes me, it suggests to me that, that, um, this who's who maybe came out before that DC comics presents issue. Yeah. Or they just knew that burn Superman was coming. Oh, that's true. Yeah. 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 Very, very strange. One of the big takeaways for this phantom girl entry, Jaime Hernandez doing the artwork. Yeah. <laughs> How great is that? Yeah. Especially the, um, the, the image of her in her earlier costume. I don't know that that just it just looks beautiful to me. I mean, totally, totally right out of Love and Rockets and Locusts, you know, Maggie Hopi, all that stuff. <laughs> um, and the who's who did that a lot. You know, they brought in some independent at the time artists. I mean, mm-hmm. the very next page of who's who is Phantom Lady by Dave Stevens, you know, like um, very, very cool. Very cool. Sorry, was there anything else about Phantom Girl? Because she's she's one of your favorites, right? She is, yeah. An unexplainable favorite um, outside of maybe just that she looks like Donna Troy. I don't know. Okay, okay. (laughs) I have a thing for dark-haired girls, I guess. Well, so like I said, um, I don't know if you if you were if you were about to move on, but no, I had some notes for. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Just quick things here. I think her title logo is kind of eh. You know, the design of the title logo is is okay. Um, she began the longest consecutive membership in the team's history. That's well documented. Um, and her appearance in Action 276 is also the first appearance appearance of Triplicate Girl, Shrinking Violet, Bouncing Boy, Sun Boy, and Brainiac 5. Mm-hmm. Created by Jerry Siegel, Jim Mooney, 1961. We always have that question, you know, who's first, Triplicate Girl or Phantom Girl outside of the big three? Most places give it to Triplicate Girl, and they say that Phantom Girl is the fifth member. But there's also a little bit of like continuity confusion because when the Legion first appears, there are other members. Right. And they just don't get defined until later. And then there's something about like, like, there's an argument that Supergirl actually joined before Superboy because of the. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, like oh, it's all kind of craziness, right? So I just sort of, I just sort of say, look, the, the second or third appearance of the Legion of Superheroes, they said they were the kids of the original. Mm-hmm. So the whole the whole beginning of that story is kind of messy. So I'll just take it for what it is. Yeah, I, that that was actually one of the things that I was looking through my omnibuses uh, uh, for was well when when do we for sure see Phantom Girl and and possibly when do we see someone who suggests that or uh, that is suggested that it is Phantom Girl so to speak um, before she's truly identified um, and I didn't I didn't really find anything definitive there plus I forgot to actually write down the issue numbers but. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that that I I uh I was looking for was cuz they uh they say here that this this faith in Ultra Boy became the beginning of one of the great legion romances. And so I was curious when that started. Uh, how far back was this this relationship? Mm-hmm. And again, I didn't write down the issue numbers though, although I did I did find the stuff, but um there was a story uh, so I apologize to the listeners that I'm I'm not on my uh, on my uh, my game here, but there was a story uh, where uh, Ultra Boy, uh, one of one of the many times that the Legionnaires um, uh, it looked like that the, he had betrayed the Legion, or uh, in fact, in fact, in this case, he it was revealed that he was a criminal. Uh, it turns out that he wasn't, but it, you know, it was just this elaborate ploy for him to. Um, uh, get the bad guys. But anyway, she pro- professes her faith in him as a legionnaire. And from that, and then several issues later, there's there's an issue where Brainiac 5 goes on a tirade against uh, Saturn Girl and Lightning Lad and Ultra Boy and Phantom Girl because they're smooching all the time. 
And how dare they? <laughs> this is serious Legion business, and there's no, we have no room, no time for, for, for you know, romance. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so yes, I did, I did, I did corroborate that their relationship is a pretty long-lived one, uh, but it's no more long-lived than say Saturn Gorilla and, and uh, Lightning Lad. Yeah, I, I, like I said, didn't really have much outside of the artwork and. Um... I don't know. Maybe one day I'll just go through and do what you did and read all these Phantom Girl stories and go, why do I like her? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I, I've always liked her, too. Um, it doesn't hurt that she is paired up with one of my favorite Legionnaires. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, when I, I guess maybe going back to some of the stuff that we've read recently with her, you know, that whole idea of, you know, Joe took a peek under Sensor Girl's costume last year issue and this issue uh it, it's hardly worth with worth noting but but given that it's phantom girl she uh as as Ultra boy is explaining what he did there's a couple of times where it's like she she objects to him in front of everybody joe you shouldn't joe don't do that you know basically and i thought well that's 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 kind of a weird reaction from her given that he's already done it she was with him and there has been some time that's passed, at least at least um, half a day, where you know they were uh, probably together. And if she objected to him doing that, she would have voiced that to him already. Anyway, so I'm just for some reason I just like these two together, and I like to see the relationship thing, you know, beyond the fact that they are simply just boyfriend girlfriend. Um, that there's actually some sort of well, relationship there, that it's not just uh, this this really simplistic one right, uh, right. That, that we normally see with these characters. Anyway. Okay, next up, Polar Boy. Um, I think this is a great entry art-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it is Steve Lytle. Steve Lytle. <laughs> love the way he looks, love the stance. I love all the background stuff. I think the background stuff oh, is I... really smart. I love that. That's the best thing about this. Yeah. The split of his costume, the split of his teams between the legions yes. and the subs. We get to see his face without the skull cap. Uh, his mission monitor board symbol. I mean, just everything about it is great. Uh, there wasn't much I got in the way from the text, but I think the imagery is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. He, Polar Boy has, ever since his his admission to the team has been to me one of those this character has great potential being uh being a former sub member wanting to be for the longest time be a member of the team and now is a member of the team you know what comes next with this character and so far i have to say i've been a little disappointed uh because he's been i think mostly sidelined for a lot of this uh, I mean, there's good reason story-wise, but I'm I, I keep thinking there should be a spotlight on him, more of a spotlight on him as a Legion member, and what does that mean? And and uh, let's explore more of the relationships he has with these other Legionnaires, whom he has known because of his former sub um, uh, membership. So please, God, let there be more with Polar Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I also love the thing in his power description, right? He's like uh, personal combat training without distinction. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> kind of a lot. Well, I, I think I think a lot of the Legionnaires actually have something along those lines right. too. So it's not just not just him. It's a nice little although, running gag. Yeah. Although I guess, you know, a Phantom Girl sa- just simply says has completed personal combat training. But that may be more of a well, no, I guess they could have changed the art, but uh, uh, no, they're, they're uh, well. He it looks like you know, inch column wise, uh, Polar Boy has just a tiny bit more space in his text, so maybe they had to cut that out of Phantom Girl, or maybe you know, like you say, it's it's more of a commentary on Polar Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Prody and Prody Two. Ah, uh, yes. I have here, um, I I really think the whole 
the way the Prodi 2 has bucked the idea that he's just a mascot and he becomes a, mm-hmm. a <laughs> political revolutionary. I, it's, first of all, it's hilarious and also brilliant at the same time. That he's just not going to settle being Chameleon Boy. The second one, anyway. Especially, it's almost like he kind of saw what happened to the first one. He's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. I'm not sacrificing my life for somebody. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna be a... <laughs> I'm either going to be a member of this, a member of the Legion of Super Pets. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to try to get sentient rights for my for my people. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, what what a what an awesome jump from what the original Prody was to to this this, this politically active leader <laughs> of of a uh, potential leader of a people. And and I'm, I I've, I've commented before, you know, whenever the subplot uh, involving the Proteans has come up in these issues, it's like, well, when are we going to actually get some sort of either focus on or resolution of of that of that plot line. So I'm I'm looking forward to that as well. If they even do anything, I don't. I don't exactly. I don't yeah. I'm. Yeah. That's the other thing. Is like, well, is this going to be one of those subplots that just never goes anywhere, never gets resolved? Well, think about it. They could have done the whole founder changeling thing way before Deep Space Nine if they really wanted to. Oh my to. god. That's right. <laughs> I mean, if they weren't, if they weren't such a benevolent sort of uh, 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 sedated, <laughs> that's not the word I really want. But you know, they're just, they're just. Remember that first story when when you even got to meet him the first time? They're like, oh, look how cute these little circles, these little, you know, white dis- nondescript circles. Oh, when the water comes, they become fish, you know. Oh, when when there's bad weather, they become birds, you know. Like, um, But in reality, they could be, they could take over everything if they wanted to. What if, what if they were, instead of clones, you know, for the dark circle, of of you know what is it five or six members or mm-hmm. people creatures aliens uh what if it were the proteans instead oh my <laughs> uh, the description is great for a protean he has great charisma <laughs> that's brilliant it's a great entry and i don't i don't think it says here but i read somewhere yeah i don't i'm not seeing it that um so, you know, it talks about how proteans have limited telepathic abilities so they can communicate. But I think I read somewhere recently that Prote 2 actually uh, develops the power of speech. Hmm. Seems like it could be a possibility. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it, it said something specifically about forming a larynx so that he could talk. Oh, wow. Curious. Is the I don't have the page of is it Giffen on the artwork? Did we did we say that? It's Giffen and Joe Rubenstein. Okay. All right. And you get the you get a classic uh, Giffen uh, image of, of uh, using lots of shadows to and showing um, Chameleon Boy with Prody One on his shoulder as he often was depicted back when Prody One was alive. Okay, let's go to Pulsar Stargrave, one of the more enigmatic villains of the legion because no one can figure out what the hell his origin is yeah. and even the who's who doesn't try to figure it out <laughs> yeah was he was he was he brainiac was he uh descendant was he <laughs> what was, was he? he brainiac five's so, father yeah yeah all that yeah just that whole thing when because so so uh we had talked about pulsar stargrave because he appeared in what the legion annual the, the uh, substitute uh, special or was it the special? Yeah, remember he got his nose bit. Okay, off. that's right. Yes. Okay, um, and uh, you, you may recall, listeners may recall, uh, I was not very pleased with that because of the way that uh, Giffen mm, made him a joke. <laughs> mm. <laughs> because uh, Pulsar Stargrave, when when I first came into the reading the Legion in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, I was getting as many back issues as I could afford. And one of the issues I got featured Pulsar Stargrave and, uh, and, and also kind of the, the mystery surrounding him, who he was and what he could do and all that kind of stuff. And I've always been intrigued by this character. 
and part of that intrigue or that interest is because we don't really know who he is or what his motivations are and what he's, what's he trying to accomplish, uh, which, uh, you know, on one hand, yes, that can be a weakness because, he, you know, they don't know what to do with the character. So they keep introducing these things about him and adding on to it all these layers and it could, because there's really nothing there, which that's probably what's going on. But for some reason, I have this um, uh, appreciation for the character. So I, I didn't I didn't care for the uh, the, uh, the 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 substitute heroes take uh, his, uh, Giffen's humor uh, hoisted onto him. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's just my little um, hang up on this character. <laughs> I mean, they mentioned in the description, you know, he's a he's a contemporary or on the level of a Mordru and a time trapper. Uh, that's pretty huge. Right. And and yet we don't I don't think I, I, I will admit I have not read every appearance of this character, but that's not the assessment I would I would uh, lay on him. Um, I think he likes to think of himself at that level, but I don't see it. And Giffen probably looked at his design and was like okay i know my girl was very popular but the bell bottom thing and the, the that's gotta go <laughs> so he probably looked at the character and was like no i don't know yeah no thank you i i but i love this this the art here keith keith pollard uh willie blyberg I, that's that's just that's just lovely looking uh art here on this page bell bottoms and all yeah, it's a pretty big entry for for such a sort of minor character. That's true. Yeah, yeah. created by Jim Shooter and Mike Grell. Okay, well, that's Who's Who number eighteen. We we will continue our trek through Who's Who. Um, in a couple of episodes, we may even include. I think I mentioned this to you in our breakdown of upcoming uh um episodes for the legion project eric um we might include some other dc centric titles that spotlight certain characters every now and then so when we get there we'll let you know Mm -hmm. just a little tease for now all right and then lastly booster gold seven we had a big conversation in the last episode booster gold six because of this idea of we are post-crisis, but the Superman that is in Booster Gold 6 and 7 is clearly not the burn version just yet, but he's also not technically the pre-crisis. He's like this limbo Superman. Some of that doesn't really play into this issue. It's just a conclusion of the adventure from issue number 6, where Booster Gold finds himself out in space for the first time. And gets caught up in in um, the confusion of of a of an alien culture's uh, civil war or or um, um, mutiny or whatever you want to call it. Um, but we get some some quick little things. I mean, we get the Legion flight ring on Booster Gold's hand. It, it's not mentioned, but it is shown. Um, last issue, Superman didn't even recognize the damn thing. But what we get here is we get more of that idea post-crisis that time is not an easy thing to navigate. We got it in the Time Trapper stuff with Legionnaires 3, I think, a tiny bit. And then we also got it in um, the mon issue from issue number 23 where they had to go back to Superboy's time, but they were noticing that time is is just fluctuating. It's just it's just acting not normal. And Skeets even says it here again, and he puts a name to it, which is which is great. Um, he says uh, he references the great time void that begins in 1986. Yeah. So now we're putting a year to it, which is cool. That that was the the bit out of that issue, which, by the way, I, I quite enjoyed that that issue overall. Oh, cool. Just just the just the whole, um, uh, the opposition of Superman versus Bruce Gold right. and their uh, their approach to that situation. I thought that was that was really well done. But but uh, you know, just in terms of you know Legion connection, 
that great that great time void line really stuck out to me and so i that's that's the thing i i got out of that issue in terms of the legion and you know so what is what does that mean is that just again building on what the 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 stuff that we've already we've already talked about that you mentioned just now uh uh how much how much communication was there going on between um Jurgens and the Legion team, and and you know, was was DC really trying to make uniform what the timeline was mm-hmm. for their line at that time? I you know, just I thought that was it implies a certain amount of planning, or at least on some people's parts, right. uh, what what all that means. So I thought that was really, uh, you know, there's not much there, but maybe definitely done, perhaps. Yeah. And we talked about like it's gonna play. It could play out here in Booster Gold because he's a creature of time. It could play out in Legion of Superheroes. We obviously had that weird little crossover into Hex, which took place and takes place mm-hmm. in DC's future. I mean, it's DC was no stranger to doing like some co- sort of editorial mandate. Um, certainly, when it came to Justice Society post Crisis, you really didn't get appearances or mentions of Justice Society of America because whether they were trying to figure out exactly how to fit them into the continuity or they were waiting for the history of the DC universe or they just wanted to focus on the future, right? The present um, uh, the present day of these characters or the future of these characters, you know, not, not the 30th century future, but just what was DC mm-hmm. going to be like post-crisis, you know? Right. Um, so it, it makes sense that maybe there was also the mandate of, look, we can no longer be going back and forth through dimensions, number one, parallel Earths, but we can't, we, we also can't do it with time. No more going to the great disaster, no more going to the future, um, you know, with the, with the Legion of Superheroes. We can't have a, you know, if, if the reverse flashes from the 25th century, we can't have all these other characters also go to the 25th century and it looks completely different. You know, they wanted to really streamline things. So, so I like it. I like that they're really paying attention to it in these few titles. And that's one of the things I like about digging back into these stories. Um, Superman even asks Skeets, you know, is what he's, is what booster booster gold being here from the future? Is he supposed to be here? And Skeet says, uh, yes, you know, it is, even though Booster doesn't know, it is well established that there was a Booster Gold in the in the twentieth century. Each man must feel that he controls his destiny, that he is creating history, not fulfilling it. And that seems to appease Superman a little bit there. Which which I thought was kind of curious, you know, that he takes this machine's word for it. <laughs> but you know, that that was that was Superman. Yeah. Of course, of course, Skeets is also the most mm, uh, um, uh, reliable narrator in, in the Booster Gold comic. Mm-hmm. So, and it goes to show that this Superman again, he feels older. He feels more established. I guess I really should say that he would take Skeets' word for that. You know that he that he mm-hmm. has experience out in space and galaxies. Even Lois Lane is we get an appearance by her is clearly not Burns Lois Lane. Oh yeah. She looks like the eighties pre-crisis Lois Lane with that straight black hair just coming down. Her, her wardrobe is very not burn. Um, she feels like a Dick Giordano character more than anything. Um, or that two issue Lois Lane series that comes out in the eighties at the time. Like, you know, there's just a lot of clues that you're like, yeah, this is, this is still, now, what's interesting is the the that confrontation, that comparison between the two characters, Superman and Booster Gold, that you mentioned, will play out in a Burn Action Comics issue. So, even though this isn't technically the Burn Superman, their history still stays, and uh, mm. it's in Action Comics five ninety four, which doesn't come out for you know a number of months later. Where Byrne, even um, on the cover, he does a flip of this cover. So instead of Superman beating on Booster Gold, Booster Gold is beating on Superman. 
and their history is referenced again. So might be fun to whenever, like I said, it doesn't come out for a while, but just touch on it a tiny bit. I don't think it has any Legion connection, but it's kind of fun. So yeah, weird little DC, DC limbo time going on here, but with some some groundwork for a future Legion and Superman story. Mm-hmm. Is is this also that great the great time boy that begins in 1986? Is this also a reference to or precursor for the Cosmic Boy miniseries? I I think so. Yeah, which we're gonna is that is it? Do you think it's that direct? I do. Yep. Yeah, okay. It. I think the Cosmic Boy, the Cosmic Boy miniseries has connections to Legends. It has connections to obviously Legionnaires three. And it and it abs- and it does have uh, a, a direct connection to this time void. Um, not to spoil anything, but but um, Cosmic Boy very quickly in the opening pages realizes that, from what I remember, time is not right. Some the past mm-hmm. is not right. So that's and that's the kickoff of the entire Cosmic Boy miniseries. So, so that means DC Comics at the time that Booster Gold was number seven was being uh, created. They they already knew where they were heading with the whole yeah. timeline Legion Superboy stuff. Yep. Yeah, and we got that. What was it uh, in issue twenty three when he and Night Girl were going away? Right when they were when they took mm-hmm. the bubble to go back in time. Like that was the setup for it. So yeah, right. and we're gonna have in Booster Gold eight and nine the origin of Booster Gold featuring the Legion of Superheroes. So we definitely will have to cover those issues. And I'm not sure if they mentioned th- anything about the time, but I guess we'll find out. Okay. Are we done for this episode, I think? I I think we are. Yeah. Coming back into an anniversary issue, <laughs> issue 25, and uh, just after our own third year anniversary, going into our fourth year now. Yeah. We, you got a chunky episode. <laughs> So, all right. So onward to issue 26. I believe we have two more issues, 26 and 27, to wrap up the Sensor Girl stuff. Um, uh, definitely, uh, this was fun getting back to this again. I hope the listeners had fun listening. Please email us, peter at thedailyrios.com or longboxreview at gmail.com. We want to hear your feedback, not only on this episode, but on future episodes as well. Eric, any other thoughts? Nope. I think I think we we've uh, <laughs> exhausted uh, this issue, um, but man, uh, I'm excited to to read the next two for sure. Awesome. Me too. Always a pleasure talking, Eric. This Same. was fun. Yep. Yep. And as always, long, long live, live the, the Legion, Legion Project, Project Podcast. Podcast. See you, everybody. Bye bye.